Smoke Radio for the masses. Headline edition, July 8, 1947. The Army Air Forces has announced that a flying disc has been found and is now in the possession of the Army. If the game is rigged, change the game. Game changer. I occasionally think how quickly our differences worldwide would vanish if we were facing an alien threat from outside this world. This is Fade to Black with your host, Jimmy Church, on the Game Changer Radio Network and KGRA, the Global Radio Alliance. I need your help to get to the year 1985. to Fade to Black with Jimmy Church on the Game Changer Network. All right. How you doing? Fade to Black. Bespoke radio for the masses. Today's Wednesday. June 29th, 181 days into the new year, 185 days left. We are live from a bunker somewhere in downtown Burbank, California. And I would like to welcome everybody listening all around the world, all across the United States, hither and thither, to and fro, back and forth, up and down, east and west, north and south, far and near. This is Fade to Black. For KJCR, the Game Changer Network, and KGRA, the planet, I am your so humble host, Jimmy Church. How you doing, everybody? It's, It's Wednesday. It's not Thursday. It's Wednesday. You're in the right place. It is Fader Nights. Open lines all night long. John Rappaport and his No More Fake Newsroom. Tomorrow night, we're in the air. Friday, we will be broadcasting from the Roswell Festival. Same place, same time. Everything's cool. Call in number tonight, 323-825-5045. Follow us on Twitter, at Radio. The hashtag, F2B is the sandbox. Facebook, YouTube, go follow, like, and subscribe. You know what to do. Email throughout the show is jimmy at jimmychurchradio.com. Any questions or comment? Comments as they are popping in right now. Ryan comes in with, who is Peter Moon? Ryan, already drinking. Did I say Gobekli Tepe? Yet? Oh, man, who is Peter Moon? All right. Well, I, I guess that's better than, you know, I think Peter Moon played drums for The Who, is uh, who that is, Ryan. And uh, there you go. Any questions or comments during the show, all you got to do is use the hashtag F2BQ like Ryan just did, wondering who the drummer was from The Who. He's going to come back with, who is The Who? <laughs> Five, four, three, two, one. Uh, it didn't pop up yet. There you go. All right. Sponsor. Uh, <laughs> I am eating in the studio. I'm breaking the rules. I am eating dark chocolate covered cashews <sighs> uh, with sea salt. And they have on the outside, you know, it's cashews, dark chocolate, and then crushed cashews on the outside (laughs) these things are gnarly i can't even concentrate right now all right support the show support our sponsors go to life change tea get the tea.com very simple the banner's right there use the promo code jimmy you want my advice go to the specials page pick something out it's all good whatever ails you you're gonna get hooked up use jimmy when you order j-i-m-m-y very simple over the phone or online when you check out. Simple. Also, Studio Dome. I saw Allison posted her uh, Studio Dome speakers today. I saw that. Don't think I didn't see it. Because I did. 
Very cool. Check out that sponsor, Studio Dome. Just go to the banner. Use the promo code JCRTWS, which is in the banner, just in case you forget it. You get two SB B2 speakers, stereo, Bluetooth stereo, hard shell case, power supply cables, wireless, done, free shipping, 129 bucks. What more do you want? There you go. All right, that's it. It's our last broadcast here in Los Angeles for the week. Tomorrow we head out to Roswell. We're going to roll into town uh, late tomorrow night. And uh, there's al already some fader knots there, so everybody just relax. We'll be there. And uh, tomorrow night, uh, Clyde Lewis is broadcasting and uh, from the McDonald's in, uh, in, or is that, no, wait, that's tomorrow, tonight? Tonight's the McDonald's. Tomorrow, he's at the museum. That's what it is. And depending on how much energy I have, but I'm going to see if I can go crash that party tonight before Clyde gets off the air. I'm going to walk right in there, walk up, and sit down next to him and grab the microphone. Hope he's listening right now. Get ready, because I'm going to do it. And there you go. So Friday night, we're broadcasting from the Roswell Festival. And uh, come and hang out with us. It's going to be great. And right when we get back into town, uh, did I have did I have an announcement tonight? Do you guys remember what I was talking about last night? I think I had something. Uh, we'll get to that. I, I just can't remember what it was. But when we come back on Sunday, we'll broadcast next week and then over at Coast to Coast. And then we head out to the Awareness Life Expo, and that's August 12th, 13th, 14th at the Crown Plaza Hotel up in Sacramento. Again, the links are over at jimmychurchradio.com. Let's get this show cracking. Today, Gary Boosie is 72. <laughs> he did play the best Buddy Holly that I've ever seen. And on this day in history, 1995, on this day, the American space shuttle Atlantis docks with the Russian space station Mir to form the largest man-made satellite ever to orbit Earth. This historic moment was the cooperation between, you know, the former enemies, rival space programs, and whatnot. And it was also the 100th human space mission in American history. Well, at that time. All right. Fader fact. Adolf Hitler. Adolf Hitler was member... 555 in the Nazi party. Checked out his card today. Saw it. Number 555. But the party started counting at 500. <laughs> he, he was number 55. Oh, that is just the funniest thing ever. Man, wouldn't it be cool? If you, uh, you know, signed on to Twitter, you open up your Twitter account, they give you like 500 bonus, you know, Twitter followers. <laughs> so everybody would look and say, hey, man, you got 501. You know what I'm saying? That's what that is. Pretty funny. Tonight's Fader Night. Open lines all night long. 323 uh, 323-825-5. Five, five, four, five. I cannot see everybody. I just cannot see. I've got glasses on and I just, man, that's it. Glasses are off. That's it. Rita, I, I, I can't do this anymore. I can't even read my own phone numbers. 323 all right, the big announcement. Let's do this. I guess I'll go ahead and do this. Rita, get ready. We'll start posting now. The big announcement about next week on Faded Black. Monday. Are you ready? Manu Interami is going to be here. He is the director of the new film, The Circuit. That's right. On Tuesday, Victor Vigiani is going to be here with the newly leaked NORAD documents. Wednesday, we have an exclusive interview with the voice of Anonymous. The voice of Anonymous is going to be here. 
on Fade to Black. Thursday night, Fader night, John Rappaport. Saturday and Sunday, over hosting Coast to Coast AM. So how was that for a week on Fade to Black? I had to take off my glasses so I didn't make a mistake. That's right. The Voice of Anonymous is going to be here on Wednesday to answer any and all questions. The Voice of Anonymous is also asking for a debate. But then they found out how much affection I have. <laughs> That's it. Voice of Anonymous right here. Exclusive Fade to Black. So Monday, Manu Itriami, director of the new film, The Circuit. And we may have, by the way, uh, a very, very, very special guest that we're going to announce that is one of the stars of the film. And I, I, I can't jinx it right now, but it looks like it's going to happen. And if you know about the circuit and you want to go and read and see who the cast is, one is going to stick out and you're going to go, holy crap. But I'm not going to say it now. Tuesday, Victor Vigiani and the leaked NORAD documents. Victor right now wants the United States to arrest him. <laughs> they do. He's, that's what he is saying. That's on Tuesday. Wednesday, the voice of Anonymous. Thursday, Fader Night with John Rappaport. Saturday and Sunday, Coast to Coast AM. There you go. That is a Ryan who, who is anonymous. <laughs> I love you guys. The Fader family is the very best. And that's why we do Thursday nights just for you. All right. 323-825-5045. Now, I'm not the only fan of time travel. We're going to talk about that tonight. And uh, I want to open up the phone lines for a couple of things tonight. Number one is uh, uh, the Mandela effect in time travel is, is something that is really trending right now. And I, I love it that people are talking about it. And so I, I want to jump into that tonight, and I want to hear your stories. But also, this is it. This is uh, the anniversary weekend. Well, next year's the 70th. This year's 69 for Roswell. And it is the one case. It's the one case that has been picked apart, studied, talked about, movies, documentaries, websites, Books on books on books. Researchers have, I mean, it's it's the one case, right? It's, it's the big one. And we're going to be out there this weekend. And I want to know your opinions about Roswell. There's so many facets to the story. It, it's, it's an incredible story. I have studied it since it first broke. And I don't think there is an angle that I haven't, picked up a piece of paper and looked underneath it and, and kept going. So I want to discuss that tonight with you and take your phone calls on Roswell. Now, it's, it is it is a subject that has been talked to death, but there's a reason for that. Number one, <laughs> it really happened. We know that it did. We know that it did. Now, what happened after that? We know something crashed on that on that ranch. Military says it's a flying saucer. Then they changed their story, right? In the original newspaper article, it says that the saucer is on its way to right field. It says it in the article, the press release by the Army Air Force themselves. Okay, now, so what happened after that? Okay, there you go. Tons of research out there. But it is the one case that happened. So... I do. I want to talk about that. It is so important to ufology, to the human race, to the earth, to the questions of, you know, are we alone? It all rests right there in that first week of July, 1947. Okay. Now, there were two episodes, two incidents that happened. Three, actually. Okay. You had uh, Tacoma, Washington. You had Seattle, Washington. And you had... Uh, uh, Phoenix, Arizona. Okay, that all let right, right before Roswell. 
So there you go. All right. So I want to talk about that now. Uh, but back to time travel. I'm not the only fan of time travel out there. And you don't have to be part of us and our family to be a fan of time travel or to know about it. Obviously, there's movies made about it once a month. Books about it once a month. You want to write a book? You want to write a movie? Throw time travel in. You got yourself a hit. It's just the way that it is. And they don't necessarily have to be in our circle to do that. And the people that go and watch those movies have never heard of Fade to Black or Coast to Coast or Ancient Aliens. Think about that. All right. Now, but we found this revelation posted on the website Fandom by Jorge Albert. And so I want to share it with you because it's really cool. And I saw it. So did you. And we're going to go over this right now. But it's interesting how somebody figured this out. Because a few episodes ago, Game of Thrones featured the death of Hodor. Right? The final sacrifice. He's holding the door shut. Right? The it, it was a tearjerker. We know that. And it was the end of uh, the piggyback rides. And I also said uh, to Rita that I'm not so sure Hoder died. You know, that I'm not so sure that we're done with Hoder. But anyway, it was a big revelation. And it was the revelation as, uh, as reference to the source of Hoder's famous word. Hoder, right? That's all he said. His real name was Willis. And... Why did he lose the ability to speak and start incessantly repeating Hoder? Because Bran, uh, he has the ability to see the past and go into the past. That's where the time travel stuff pops in. And so he goes into the past and branding his mind with Mirror's command to hold the door against the army of whites, right? Now, it makes perfect sense. You see Hoder lying on the ground, hold the door, hold the door, hold the door, Hoder, Hoder, right? Okay? So Hoder's disability led to his ultimate sacrifice, which in turn led to his disability, which in turn led to his ultimate sacrifice. Wait a minute. <laughs> Hold on for a second. Bran changed the past to create the future. That let him change the past to create the future. And as you know, we got ourselves a genuine paradox. This, this type of time travel conundrum is called is called a um, a causality loop, and for those of you that understand this, okay, you know you're just getting a brush up here. But for those of you that don't understand what I'm saying, let me let me explain how it works. In its most basic form, you have event A that causes event B, which in turn, in some way event a it, it, it's a cause a cause and cause event a causes event b which in turn in some way causes event a again in this way time will form a loop you're just going to go in a circle you're not going to be able to get out of that and if everything else is continuing on as normal then it doesn't make sense because that loop is happening in the background and you don't know what cause the the event A, event B, event A again, because time has moved on. Now it it's it's uh it's like feedback in a in a guitar. It's exactly what it is. It's just cycling. Now, if you were smart enough to catch that, Hoder was a paradox. There was no way that he could have moved forward, have been being told about hold the door and hold the door closed. 
couldn't have happened because it already did, right? Yeah. We're not talking about an alternate timeline here, or parallel this, or it. No, that's the way it's written in the story. Now, it happens so fast, and the way that it is, it's just one of those things where you go, oh, so that's where Hoder came from. Oh, it means hold a door. Oh, I get it. Bran went back and said, okay, hold the door, and now he's back here, and he's holding the door. But it doesn't work that way. It isn't the first time a causality loop has appeared. It's it's all over the place. It's in Robert Heinlein's 1941 time travel story by his bootstraps. And in that story, a time traveler passes on the blueprints of uh, of a time machine, gives them to a buddy who then copies and creates those same blueprints. Right. Doesn't make sense. But it's a good story. Heinlein would continue this uh, causal loop theme in his 1959 All You Zombies and which a woman man becomes his own mother and father. Yeah. Weird story. Good story. Um, it's in all over the place. And if, if you go and start to look for these kind of loops, it's all over Doctor Who. It's every episode. Time crimes. It's in Interstellar. Rita and I were talking about that yesterday. And and in, in Interstellar, if you remember, Matthew McConaughey is trying to uh, get a message to his daughter. Right? Well, th that's a that's a serious time loop there because he is light years away and uh, uh, and and pushing books in the library and trying to get uh, Morse code to, to her and also the watch. Right. Well, none of that could happen. But anyway, Interstellar, Star Trek, Lost. It's all over Lost. In fact, in, in Game of Thrones, that episode with Hoder was directed by Jack Bender. The same director who filmed Lost uh, Time Travel episode, which was called The Constant. In this episode, you remember Desmond is revealed to be unstuck in time, bouncing back and forth between 1996 and 2004. Remember, he's on the boat and he's able to do that and go back and forth. It was actually pretty cool to watch that. But that time loop is a common thing. And most of the time, it will remain a paradox unless you pull out of it and get to an alternate timeline because paradox is a paradox right so there you go time travel paradoxes in game of thrones <laughs> all right let's see here idea just said interstellar is the best depiction of the structure of space and time very well thought out you can tell this is the thing. There's nobody that can write screenplays in Hollywood like that. You know, you can tell that they had consultants and physicists and theorists all over the place uh, the, to get the math to work and, and so forth. Not only with uh, the wormholes and the idea of black holes and uh, and time travel and how all of that would apply. Um, very, very good script writing. Now, this is what was brilliant. For about Interstellar. Number one, I didn't see it for a few months. I didn't see it in the theater. I had to wait for it to come out because I do the show every night. So we we just didn't catch it. But it enabled me to go and study the film and 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 see how the physicists dealt with all of this time travel stuff and 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 the wormholes and and the black holes. And but if you listen to this show every day, if you're here every day then that means you're out there doing your own thing and researching. You're into this subject. So when you go to see Interstellar, you know, if your Yahoo cousin is with you that doesn't follow, you know, this show or shows like this, they're going to see an entertaining movie, but most of them is going to blow right over their head. You are sitting there going, man, this is great because you get all of it. And that's what was really cool for me for Interstellar. I mean, I just I got it the first pass through. I've seen it. I've seen Interstellar since, uh, I'm going to go with 20 times. I can't get enough of the movie. And it's just really clever how they've uh, put it together. It's, it's pretty clever. They've almost pulled it off. The paradox situation when you're sitting in the same, uh, uh, when you're in the same timeline, the paradox situation doesn't work. I, I wrote a short story back in school 
probably, I mean, it's got to go back to 81. And I wrote a time travel story. And I'm a young kid, right? And the time travel story was simple because I was, I was playing guitar uh, at the time and, and really wanted to be, a, you know, a musician, uh, a good guitar player. But I was into this time travel, man, and I was just studying it and, and reading as much as I could. I was 81, so I'm probably 16, 17 years old. And anyway, so I write this story. And the story was a simple one. This kid stumbles into a laboratory, uh, and and there is a couple of scientists there, and they tell him that they're uh, moving this monkey into another space and time, and they're going to bring him back, and he sees this happen. He goes back and wants to become a, a, a you know a famous guitar player, so he jumps into this machine and he goes back ten years with all the knowledge of his guitar. I've talked about it on this show before, and then ten years later he comes back to the same spot, to the same laboratory, and goes back in time again and takes that knowledge, and then he goes into this loop, and he becomes this super musician, right? But if you think about it, it's impossible, right? It's just It just doesn't work that way, because where's the other self, you know? And that's it, it, it's something that I never quite worked out. I always thought that it worked in my own mind uh, back then. I rewrote the story many times to make sure that there wasn't anything wrong with it. But I see the problems with it today. I mean, I don't know. Maybe maybe the idea would work. I, I need to dust that story off and, and rework it. All right. It is Fader Night, everybody. I want to talk about the Mandela effect. I want to talk about time travel. Did you see Game of Thrones, uh, the uh, episode with Hoder? And did you catch the paradox? And I wouldn't mind talking about a little Game of Thrones tonight. And we'll get caught up on the news. And when I come back after this short break, John Rappaport is going to be here with his No More Fake Newsroom with a very special report tonight. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. This is Fade to Black. It's Fader Night. It's your night. 323-825-5045. Email is jimmy at jimmychurchradio.com. You can also follow me on Twitter at jchurchradio. Two minutes. I'll be right back. to Jimmy Church, Fade to Black. Fade to Black will now pause for alien identification. The station that talks the net. KGRA Radio. What's up, revolutionaries? It's me, Jimmy Church. Do you have an IRS or state tax issue? Well, I did, and I called national tax experts. My problems were fixed, done, fini, and man, I got to tell you, it was a relief. National tax experts are a recognized tax office that services clients in all 50 states. doesn't matter where you live. Give them a call. I'm telling you, they take the time to understand each and every client's individual financial status as well as their financial goals. And that's exactly what you need, my brother, when you're taking on the evil three letter. So, seriously. Give them a call today at 1-877-909-5444. Again, 1-877-909-5444. Or go check out their website, www.nattaxexperts.com. That's N-A-T-T-A-X-E-X-P-E-R-T-S.com. Tell them Jimmy sent you. Hi, folks. Ronnie here reminding you that June is Health Awareness Month, sponsored by Get the Tea. 
Dot com. Many of you have heard our tea commercial, maybe visited the website, but haven't committed because, well, you just don't know. Skeptical. We understand. Just to remind you, our tea is not just tea. In fact, very little tea. Life Change Tea is a unique blend of eight different herbs removing intruders that attack your health. You brew our tea to make the concentrate, you add water, and put in the fridge. Two eight-ounce glasses a day and life will be good. Visit us at GetTheTea.com. That's GetTheTea.com. And this month is lots of fun stuff with Health Awareness Month. You could be picked and receive your order absolutely free. You never know. Read the testimonies and try our products. Log on to GetTheTea.com. That's GetTheTea.com. And for great health tips, visit my YouTube channel at Health Matters Now, where you can learn about health tips and how products work on your body. Join me, GetTheTea.com. Nine out of ten geneticists agree. Fade to Black is not your father's radio show on the Game Changer Radio Network and KGRA, the planet. Hi, this is Chase Klutsky with Fate Magazine Radio, and you're listening to Jimmy Church and Fade to Black on the Game Changer Network and the KGRA digital broadcast station, where the Fade or Nots rock. Hi, this is Rob Reiner from Anvil, and you're listening to JimmyChurchRadio.com. What's up? I'm Chris. What up? This is Kyle Massey, and you're listening to Jimmy Church Radio. And now, coming to you from the No More Fake Newsroom in Deep Space, which is the space that we suspect to be true, that the world is fed to us every day by the ministry of truth is a lie, a false reality, a movie projected on the screen of our subconscious. This, however, is the breakout. All the screens crash. They all go down and we see the light of day, a new day. No more robots. No more androids. It's the No More Fake Newsroom with John Rappaport. Take us to school, John. Thank you, Jimmy. Okay. (laughs) Lots of stuff tonight, folks. Okay. As you may have noticed, there is an increased tempo of events. Boom, 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 boom. In the last two, three weeks. We'll get to some of those, but I want to start at the top here. What is globalism? What is this thing? It is a force which has been active for many, many decades now all around the world. And its objective is a new economic and political order for the entire planet. That means that there will be, at some point in the future, if this agenda is fulfilled, no more separate nations, no more borders, no more divisions, all one homogenized cheese glob of humanity under the management force of a vast, vast bureaucracy which operates under the control of a relatively few men. That's the image. That's the picture. That's the thing. David Rockefeller has been a key, key figure all along. And his intellectual sidekick, Zbigniew Brzezinski, has been involved heavily as a sort of theoretician and mentor to politicians, including Barack Obama. So that's the deal. That's what globalism is shooting for, and there are many strategies that it deploys in order to achieve this. Now, I can't get away from the definition of globalism and move along until I talk just a little bit about another thing called technocracy. The rise of the machines, the rise of the robots and the androids and the phones and the cell phones and all of the communication devices and the electronics and the surveillance state and the 
trillions and trillions of pieces of data that are accumulated by the surveillance state and so on and so forth. Now, technocracy is joined at the hip to globalism because the vision there is, and we are beginning to see little glimpses of it with Google and a couple of other country uh, companies who want to design smart cities. Yes. Isn't that wonderful? Smart cities where everything is automated, everything is regulated, everything is interlocked and intertwined. And what one observes over here can be observed over there. And it's all hooked up, folks. And everybody's tracked and everything is peaceful because, you know, you're, you're on camera all the time. And uh, the tracking system is absolute perfection and the cars are automated and there are no drivers and all of that sort of thing. Technocracy, which on a mystical level has to do with this completely insane idea of hooking up human brains to a supercomputer. We don't have time to go into all of that tonight. It's called the singularity, which is supposed to be, you know, the final revelation where all humans are embedded and hardwired in some way into a computer that gives all the right answers to all the questions all the time. Getting the picture? Okay. Now, the European Union is a branch office of globalism. Get that straight because we're looking at much of Europe, which has been laboring under a vast bureaucracy that spins out untold thousands and thousands and thousands of regulations that are not voted on by anybody except a distant remote council in Brussels. And this is the United Europe plan. It's the branch office in Europe of globalism. And what is happening in Europe is envisioned for the rest of the planet, a kind of regionalism, as it's called. We don't need separate countries anymore. What's all this insanity about nationalism and borders and all of that? We need to join up countries in various regions and we'll think of new names like the North American Union and so forth. And then eventually, all these regions will be hooked up to each other and then we will have a single global super state super duper state okay so all of a sudden out of nowhere comes this thing called brexit <clears throat> which is exit from the european union by the united kingdom by britain a referendum and campaigns go on and there's debates on both sides and there's mudslinging and all kinds of stuff. And it looks like that Brexit will be defeated and the vote is taken. And lo and behold, by a fairly small but significant margin, the people vote to exit the European Union, England, Britain, you know, one of the key countries decides we don't want this anymore it's costing us too much money we can't make our own decisions you know if we want to limit immigration for example oh it's really out of our hands because this is under the control of the eu the european union and all sorts of other things that pertain to globalism such as manufacturing companies leaving their home country and setting up overseas in slave areas, you know, pennies a day, manufacturing products and selling them back to the home countries. But in the meantime, all sorts of jobs are cut, destroyed in the home country because all it's happened in the U.S., it's happened in a number of countries. This is also part of the agenda of globalism to torpedo national economies to make them more prone to want to join up with other countries and form these kinds of uh, unbreakable alliances because, hey, we're sinking on our own, so let's all be Europe, let's all be North America, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay, but what happened? The Brits left the European Union. My goodness, my goodness, my goodness. 
Now, at the same time that all of this is happening, in and around the same period of time, we had the Orlando nightclub shooting. We had the murder of a British member of parliament, Joe Cox. We just saw the attack, the bombing attack and shooting attack on the airport in Turkey. These are not unrelated. Now, without going into a huge long song and dance here, whether or not you look at this or these events, these destructive events as staged events on purpose with an agenda in mind, or you look at the aftermath of these events and how much hay can be made out of them by, for example, the forces of globalism to convince people that we live in a dangerous world and we, it's unpredictable as to what's going to happen and terrible things can occur at any moment and therefore we have to have more cooperation among various nations. We have to eliminate this idea of separate security and so forth. Nations must all bind together uh, to combat this insanity and to make uh, our world more peaceful and safe and secure and so on and so forth. That's the theme. That's the tune. It's played over and over again along, of course, with gun control. But I'm not focusing on that so much at the moment as to give you the bigger picture of these events prove that we must all join together and share our information and data and stop this insane idea of separate countries with separate agendas because there's no way to defeat this international threat, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, without us all being united and one together. So that is the overarching takeaway from these three tragedies that I've just mentioned here. And this is all happening, mind you, at the same time as Brexit. Brexit. So, what have we learned in the last few weeks? Suddenly we've learned that the globalist agenda is not working all that well at the moment. In other words, folks, the future is not already written. I know this is a harsh lesson for some people. They can't really dig it <laughs> and go with it because there are many people who want to believe that everything is already foretold. And in some cases, these people want to believe that the forces of evil can never be overcome. And that no matter what happens, it's all planned, it's all staged for a certain effect, and that effect is always uh, brought to fruition, and we have no chance, and we should all just go back to sleep. And I've spent personally the last uh, 30, 35 years as an investigative reporter and as an author saying, no, 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 that's not true. That's never going to be true. The game is afoot and the game is never over because there is always freedom. There is always the individual. There is always the potential of the individual, his, her power, imagination, creativity, courage, resistance, etc., etc., etc. At the moment, the globalism agenda has taken a major hit, a major, major hit with the exit of Britain. And of course, predictably, there are political forces at work in England trying to say, we're going to have another referendum. You know, that, that one wasn't good enough. We didn't like what the waitress brought to the table, so we're sending back the dish, cook it again. And if we don't like it the second time, we're going to send it back again. Of course, this is predictable. And there's a big petition with several million signatures already on it to say, we want another referendum. We want another referendum. If you fall for that kind of idiocy, then there is no help. <laughs> you know, because, I mean, the vote comes, the vote is tallied, here's the result. And what are you going to do? The people 
half spaken. <laughs> but naturally, that you're going to get this kind of blowback and aftermath and so on and so forth. But again, the forces of globalism have taken a significant hit. And there are people at the Bilderberg Group, at the Council on Foreign Relations, at the Trilateral Commission, these uh, heavy globalist groups that are sitting around trying to figure out what to do. We will not let this thing slip away from us. What is happening here? Why did it all go wrong? What can we do now? We had all the major media on our side. They're still on our side. And yet, what can we do? And then on top of that, in the presidential season, what are we seeing in America? And I'm not stumping for a candidate here in case it seems that I am. So let's take Donald Trump and let's take Bernie Sanders. What have they been talking about, among other things? A revolution, a revolt against globalism in the form of these trade deals that have been proposed and are on the table and soon could be ratified called the TPP and the TTIP, and these involve Europe, the United States, 12 nations in the Pacific. They seem to be, you know, facilitating trade, but these are major, major pieces of agenda for the globalists because they give more and more power to huge mega transnational corporations and financiers to roam the world like predators with no allegiance to any nation, set up shop anywhere in the world they want to, manufacture goods with slave labor and ship those goods to the rest of the globe paying no tariffs, no taxes upon entry. This is the key. No tariffs. That's what makes it possible for all these corporations in America, for example, to have deserted the U.S. and gone abroad. Because if they had to pay tariffs to ship their goods elsewhere after they make them with slave labor, it wouldn't be worth it. But they don't have to because of all these trade deals, globalist trade deals. And now we have Donald Trump and we have Bernie Sanders in no uncertain terms, mind you. This is not the usual kind of political rhetoric, the vague, soporific, hypnosis-inducing baloney that we get every four years. These guys, and of course, they would never agree that they agree on this, you know, <laughs> But nevertheless, it's true from opposite ends, apparently, of the political spectrum, they've both been talking about the defeat of globalism, the defeat of these trade deals, the destruction of jobs in America. Bernie Sanders just wrote an editorial in the New York Times about this. Millions of manufacturing jobs lost in America over the last 15 years. 60,000 factories closed down. Why are they closed down? Because they and their competitors have gone overseas to do this thing that I just talked about here. This is also a major defection from globalism, a major breakout in the opposite direction. And it's troubled many, many elite people in the Council on Foreign Relations and the Bilderbergers and the Trilateral Commission and other of these societies that are bent on a globalist framework for the world. What is going on here? We try to kill off Trump with one expose and one article and criticism and editorial after another. We tried to kill off Bernie early and we couldn't do that either. And all of a sudden the people are rising up and actually becoming aware that there is this thing called globalism and it's destroying jobs. And for the first time in a long time, people in England, for example, people in America who have been whose manufacturing jobs, their livelihoods have been destroyed, utterly destroyed, feel like they have maybe a glimpse of a hint of a voice in all of this. And they're starting to feel a little bit yeah, okay, well, maybe we can do something. Yeah, what's going on, you see? And the way Trump is spinning this, of course, is nationalism is making a comeback. Oh, my God. What? Globalism, 
the last thing they want is that dirty, filthy, horrible word, nationalism. Not just for America, but the idea that every country in the world has the power and the right of self-determination. Remember that old phrase, self-determination? I'll feed you another one, decentralization of power. Remember that phrase? That was very popular maybe 10, 15 years ago, but the major media literally erased it from the lexicon. You don't see that phrase anymore. You see, we're all in this together, united as one, moving into a glorious future, yakety yakety yak. And now these old terms are coming back. Well, people are saying, gee, why shouldn't a nation have the right of self-determinism to decide what it wants, as opposed to some bureaucracy so remote as to be invisible passing all these laws and rules and so on. Why not? And then again, you have the Orlando shooting, Joe Cox is murdered, airport attack in Turkey. Oh, no, 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 no. Don't you see? Look at what's happening here. And somehow, and, and forget logic here, all of this is somehow being tied in a kind of psychological operation to the persistence of separation, independence, differences among nations. No, 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 no. As long as we're all in different places and we have different rules and we're in different countries, this security situation can never be solved. We must have global surveillance. We must have rule from above of the entire planet. We are now getting a globalism doubling down, which is always what happens when these uh, corrupt groups get caught with their pants down. They always double down. So what are we hearing now from several European <clears throat> leaders? We must have one army for all of Europe. <laughs> wow, where did that come from? Well, that's in the aftermath of Brexit and in the aftermath of the violence in Brussels and Paris and the murder of Joe Cox. We must have one giant army for all of Europe, really. And Europe must be not just ruled over by a vast bureaucracy in its separate nations. We have to just erase all the borders and make Europe one nation, one super nation. Wow, they're really doubling down. And with the meeting here called the Three Amigos by the press, Mexico, Canada, U.S., Yes, there's a big confab going on now. The president of Mexico says, well, why can't we just be all one country? It's time for us to, you know, the border is only a problem because it's a border. The magic trick is if you get rid of the border and make us all one country, Canada, Mexico, U.S., boop, no more problem. Uh, everything's fine now. Wonderful. That's what we need. They're doubling down and tripling down and quadrupling down because they feel the heat. They feel the pressure. They feel the panic. They feel the defection from globalism actually has some legs all of a sudden. And this has not happened, believe me, in any significant way for the past, hmm, since 1945. Not really. Not really. Something is going on, folks. And we all have something to do with it because this crazy thing called the Internet has spawned so much commentary, so much revelation, so much investigation, so much research, so much news that falls outside the mainstream and is no way connected to the mainstream that people are waking up all over the world. And one of the things they are waking up to, regardless of where they sit on the political spectrum, regardless of what they think of as this is the solution or that is the solution or whatever, is that we are living in a world that is ruled by organizations that are too big, too remote, too impersonal, too corrupt, too unconcerned with the fate of us and in particular, with the freedom of the individual. That's what more and more people are waking up to, despite themselves in many cases. They're seeing the handwriting on the wall. And these events that I'm sketching in here tonight are indications, outbreaks that are occurring 
because of this overall waking up that is in progress, is taking place, is exposing the globalist agenda on all manner of fronts here. That is what's happening. It's not just England. It's not just America. It's not just Greece. It's not just India. It's not just China. All sorts of things and undercurrents are flowing through the skeleton and the anatomy of what has been called the deep state, which is the state behind the state, which is globalists and their agenda. And this is now coming to light and all manner of breakouts are going to be occurring. Check this John out. Rappaport for no more fake news. <laughs> Thank you so much, John. Um, check this out. Growing up in America, there was one thing that was wonderful here. It was RCA Victor, uh, you know. Uh, uh, you know <laughs> the dog, the dog. Uh, General Electric, all of the television sets uh, that were across this country that were manufactured here, right? And, and those big, you remember the big, long ones that had a stereo on one end and you could lift it up and look in, there'd be a record player. And then on the other end was the TV, right? Pieces of furniture. Yeah, right? Pieces of furniture. And that weighed like 800 pounds, full of tubes, right? Now, that think of all of those manufacturing jobs, all of those Bell telephones that you had in your house, right? All made here. Do you know how many television sets are made today in the united states take a guess take a while I, I hate to ask i mean it's just going to be go ahead hit me zero wow how's that for a number zero huh zero wow. and and now and when you look at the success of uh the economies of japan and china Everybody's employed. There's, you know, it, you, all you got to do is trip and fall in China and you get hired, right? I mean, there, it, it, there's employment everywhere. It's because all of the manufacturing uh, I worked at, and I just looked at online, uh, looked at the pictures. I worked at uh, Bell Laboratories, Western Electric in Indianapolis. That plant that was there on Shadeland Avenue, anybody in Indianapolis knows. I would guess at one point, probably one out of four people in Indianapolis worked at Western Electric. It supported the entire economy. How many families put their kids through college, right? Yeah. It was so, it was the largest plastics injection molding plant on planet Earth, right? Yeah. And, you know, now why, why isn't Apple making iPhones there? You know, uh, why, it, you know, what, where did those people, you know, they, they all lost their jobs. That's and, right. And, and we need to think about that for a second. There are no TVs manufactured here in the United States. And we owned it. We invented it. And we don't have it. So, yeah, John, thank you so much. That was an eye opener, man. I got you me bet. some edumacation edg tonight. <laughs> Thank you, John. Have a great, safe weekend and uh, and a great fourth. All right? Behave out there. Thank you, Jimmy. Thank you so much. John Rappaport. It is Fader Night. His website, nomorefakenews.com. This is Fade to Black with Jimmy Church on the Game Changer Radio Network and KGRA, the Global Radio Alliance. The station that talks the net, KGRA Radio. Hello, I'm Katini, and you're listening to my main man, Jimmy Church, on JimmyChurchRadio.com. Hi, this is Ray Sobs here repping the planet, and you're listening to my good friend, Jimmy Church. Fade to black on the Game Changer Network and the KGRA Digital Broadcast Station. Results may vary. Hello, I'm Jerry Mathers. I was the beaver in Leave it to Beaver, and 20 years ago, I almost died from type 2 diabetes. When I was diagnosed with type 2, 
I was shocked. My blood sugar was through the roof. Now, the very same natural remedies I use to control my type 2 diabetes are available for you in a super easy program called the Diabetes Solution Kit. And I should know it works. I use the very same techniques to drop 40 pounds of fat, get my blood sugar under control, and watch my type 2 diabetes fade into thin air. If you have diabetes, I urge you to try this step-by-step -step plan. It has all the natural techniques I used, and it works a lot faster, too. I'm Jerry Mathers. And if I can do it, you can do it too. If you'd like to normalize your blood sugar and stop taking your diabetes medication completely with your doctor's approval, go to 33diabetesreverse.com. That's 33diabetesreverse.com. Reverse your diabetes in as little as 30 days by going to 33diabetesreverse.com. That's 33diabetesreverse.com now. Imagine no longer being tied down to your computer, but having the freedom to take live talk radio with you anywhere you go. TalkStream Live introduces our first ever iPhone application. The talk shows you follow now follow you. And your iPhone is now the fastest and easiest way to stay connected to the best talk radio on the Internet. Let TalkStream Live transform the way you listen to radio. Listen to live talk shows 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Mobile talk radio from TalkStream Live. Now available in the iTunes App Store. This is Toby Kebble. You're listening to JimmyChurchRadio.com. Don't hurt me, Jimmy. I'm only little. Hey, I'm Adrian Grenier. And this is Ari Gold. We're the Honey Brothers. We're the <laughs> yes. We are of the Honey Brothers. Hey, I'm Adrian Grenier. And I'm Ari Gold. We're the Honey Brothers. And you're listening to Jimmy Church. The Revolution. What's up, Fader Knots? Studio Dumb loves Fade to Black and the F2B audience so much that they have put together the ultimate stereo Bluetooth system. They've done it just for you. Man, check this out. The Studio Dome SBB2 stereo system is here. It's featuring two Studio Boombox 2 SBB2 wireless Bluetooth speakers packed in its own custom hard shell case. This Studio Dome system features the very latest in stereo Bluetooth technology. The two full-range boomboxes are in true wireless stereo. You've got to hear this. It's amazing. It's just $129, and use the promo code JCRTWS, and you'll also get free shipping. It's simple. Just go to JimmyChurchRadio.com, click on the Studio Dome banner. Go back, Lee Tappy. This is Micah Hanks of the Graylian Report, and you're listening to Jimmy Church on Fade to Black. Across the globe on the Game Changer Radio Network and the one and only KGRA Radio, The Planet. Thank you, John Rappaport. Man, I thought he was going to tie Brexit into uh, Turkey. If anybody could do it, it'd be John. He probably did and just held back. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. It's Fader Night. This is Fade to Black. Open lines 323-825-5045. It is Roswell weekend. So I want to talk a little, a little bit about Roswell and... I'm going to jump into that in just a second, but uh, I want to get into some of the news here really quick and put some topics on the table. The three terrorists armed with bombs and guns that killed at least now, I think the number is up to 46, uh, killed 46 people in Turkey. Of the three bombers in the attack, two were in the international terminal, and the third terrorist was in a nearby parking lot. All three detonated suicide vests. In the past two days, ISIS has conducted suicide attacks in Jordan, Lebanon, Yemen, and also, uh, apparently, Turkey. Now, they sent this out in their press release last month and said uh, it was actually in uh, late May and uh, did an audio recording. And they said, I'm quoting here, Ramadan, the month of conquest and jihad. Make it a month of calamity everywhere for the non-believers, end quote. Okay, that was their press release. On this past Monday, ISIS suicide attackers blew themselves up in a village in Lebanon, close to the Syrian border, killing five people. 
also this past Monday, a wave of ISIS suicide attacks in Yemen in the southeastern city of Mukalla killed more than 40. Yesterday, ISIS launched a suicide attack that killed seven Jordanian security personnel at a border crossing between Jordan and Syria. And of course, Turkey happened. This is no joke. And I said this, uh, uh, oh, I think I said it on Monday, but um, this is a Muslim on Muslim radical fundamentalist Islam thing against their own. It's crazy. You know, and I know that there's been the Western, you know, they've reached out and touched us and it's been tragic over here, but it's nothing compared to what they're doing to themselves. Unbelievable. All right. Uh, check this out. And then I'm going to get to Roswell. In the early morning yesterday, yesterday, a small meteorite fell onto a house in Thailand, punching a hole in the roof and doing some minor damage inside. Apparently, many people in the area, including the owner of the home, heard a loud explosion just before the impact, which was probably uh, the sound barrier being cracked, you know, the shock wave from the meteorite entering the atmosphere. I've seen the pictures of it. It's actually pretty cool. And now, aren't meteorites, I mean, they're like worth money, right? You can sell that like by the gram. <laughs> so... You got the hole in your house, but you probably got, you know, a $100,000 rock that uh, just landed in the living room. I think you can deal with it. Let's go to the phones. Hi, you're live on Fade to Black. Hi, Jimmy. This is Donna from Hawaii. I think I called you um, about a month ago with a dream. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Hi, Donna. Hi, yeah. Donna. How are you? Yeah. I, good. I'm not calling about that tonight, though. I, I think I, I settled what that was in my own mind. I think it was a way shorter dream and didn't really have anything to do with much other than myself. It was, but, uh, um, it, does it, oh, Donna, it was still a great phone call. <laughs> it was, oh, yeah. No, no. <laughs> it was, it was my a first great phone call. call. Uh, okay, so what's on your mind? <laughs> Two things. The first one, you have to settle something for me in my mind, because I don't know if it has to do with the Mandela effect or something just, you know, maybe just speaking. Okay. But, and when you talk about the contact in the desert and what Rita said, uh, at the beginning, you said what you said was they're real. Yes. And I, 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 that stuck with me in my head. Then last week, you were saying, you said, they're here. And that, uh, that kind of blew my mind. I was like, did I just hear it? You know, I just really, not with you, but just with myself. Yeah, let me call it. Then yeah. again, you said they're real. Yes, so I, yes. I'm, and and let, me right? tell you, yeah, let me tell you why that happened. Because mm -hmm. I had said, uh, Rita and I were, uh, we had company over at the house. And I was telling, you yeah. know, uh, the company the story. And and I said, uh, uh, they're here. And Rita corrected me and said, no, I said, they're real. And so I had already wow. said, I had already said it on the air. So when I came back on the air and I said it again, I said, they're real. And I have to because she'll bite my head off every single time, you know. Yeah, uh, I leave must... it to a woman to be, you know, with the details. Yeah, no, ma <laughs> yeah. no Mandela effect here. Her quote was, okay. "They're real," and I, I'm sure Rita, will you post that in Twitter? Exactly what you said when you were looking out the window of the car as we drove away. <laughs> um, I believe it was their real. Okay, so Real. yeah, we'll... I like that one better actually. Yeah, well... but um, anyway, the uh, the other thing I called for um, was with John Rappaport's um, talk tonight. Yes, um, they're, 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 they they always put out nationally. I, I love John Rappaport, so I kind of more agree with him than anything else. But they, there's always just those two choices: nationalism or globalism. Right, and that's kind of two heads of the same coin to me. I mean. There's other things out there, you know, the, the Ubuntu and the Zeitgeist and all those those other, sure. you know, world without money theories and, and, and ideas. And no one ever really puts that out there in the mainstream in a strong way. It's it's always like you're, if you're a nationalist, you hate other people and you're just this and that and you're real, a bad person. Right. If you're, you know, if you're a globalist, you're one of the elite idiots that wants to you know, take over the world with the computers. Right. So you don't have. You don't have any other choice, and to me, I don't like either one of those choices. To yeah, be honest with you. Uh, yeah, <laughs> and 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 I agree with you. But the 
the zeitgeist is a movement, and so is Ubuntu, about uh, a drastic change, and it's in the future. It's an idea. Do you understand? It's an uh-huh. idea. It's it's. It, but globalism is real. I mean, that's a real thing that we're dealing with now. That's exactly what's going on. And nationalism and isolationist and, and things like that. That's a real thing. That's a real now, now thing, as opposed to, uh, you know, the zeitgeist movement or Ubuntu, you know, no money and, 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 and that kind of thing. That's a radical change and it's an idea and it's a movement. And so it's almost, it's not quite theory, but it is, it's an idea. It's a, it's a dream. Didn't everything start out as a, as an idea? And the only way, I mean, why, why are we, we, we really can choose whatever we want. People don't have that understanding that you have, or we have the capacity to change our, our reality system, our world. If we really, and, and I think people, as they grow up, are taught that they have choices. You can be this, you can be that, you can do this, you can do that. But they're never really given the idea that they actually make and create. Right. And, and, and I think that's. Well, and, and let me help you with this. And, uh-huh. and this is how I deal with it in my own mind. But when you you have to, in in your own life, no matter what, to initiate change, you've got to hit rock bottom. you got to go to the bottom, take a peek, yeah. and, and see what it's like down there, and then you make a change. But it's difficult to make a change in your own life. If your job is okay, you're making money, you can, you know, you get up every day, it's a non-stressful thing. And, and, uh-huh. and, 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 and so making a change, moving out of state, quitting your job, you know, you, you, you have to lose your job or hit rock bottom or, or get, uh, you know, to quit smoking, you've got, or, or, or something like something drastic in your, you've got to have something happen to you. You won't make changes in your diet. Unless you get diabetes, right? <laughs> and yeah, then, and then, that's true. And People then, don't make changes unless it's, you know. Exactly. <laughs> so now let's apply that same mentality, right? That same thing to mm-hmm. like Ubuntu or, or, or Zeitgeist or communism. Karl Marx comes yeah. along, right? And when, when he started mm-hmm. speaking about it, you know what? The Soviet Union at that point, the people there, Russia... They were down. They they took a peak. You know, it was it was a bad time in, in 1900 to 1915, 1916. The revolution happened in 1917. But they mm-hmm. they they went there. They they needed the change because it wasn't working for them. And Karl Marx comes along and Stalin comes along and they start preaching this thing. And they, you know what? Change was OK because they had hit the bottom. Look at France and and the revolution that happened there, or the you know in England. You know when you go and behead your king, you know you've hit rock bottom somewhere, and it it, it goes it goes without question that you need to be in that frame of mind here in the United States right now. Now uh, we're comfortable, you know, instituting change is is a difficult thing, and I understand. You know, Barry Sanders coming along when he did and, and saying the things that he did, because you know what? We're a little bit disgusted on, on a lot of different fronts. Certainly a 25 year war is something that we're just about done with, you know. And so these mm-hmm. things that he's speaking right now, it almost caught hold. We haven't hit bottom yet here. You know, that's to, to, kind of a scary premise that we actually do have to but hit bottom. Think to, about what where Russia was at in 1917. Think about that. For them to just go, yeah. you know what? Communism is a good idea. It's better than where we are right now. Think about that. That's how bad well, that's it was. What the Trump phenomenon is. It's like people keep keep going. Why do people still want that? That you know what he's saying? It's because any. I had a friend who said, well. If you're, you know, if you want status quo, vote this way. If you want change, vote Trump. And I'm thinking, yeah, but all change is not good. But then I, I'm at that point, too, where you just kind of want to go, OK, maybe pick that change, and make everything fall apart and, and see what happens at that point. But then, well, I you know, know. I, it, I've, I've often thought and said uh, I've said this many times uh, publicly and privately. But you know what? If I was president. 
and you and and you have a company here. That's it. It's here. I mm-hmm. that's it. This is where it's at. It's us first. If everybody in America is employed and you are manufacturing so much and you can't find any more employees and and you're at that point, well then we have a conversation. But until then, everything stays here. The success of China is because we let them have it. You know, we let them have all of the manufacturing. Think about I I don't know. I I, I really don't. But I I would suppose that the majority of the American public, 90 percent, are wearing clothes made in China, are driving a car, Mm -hmm. you know, where the profits go overseas. They're watching a TV. uh, They're talking on a cell phone. Everything in their life, the plates, the silverware, the cups, everything around them is not manufactured here. Everything. And that's a frightening. It just doesn't make find something. I went looking for a teacup one time because I I didn't trust the stuff from China, hearing that they had put all these different things into it that was not good for you. And I couldn't find a teacup that wasn't made in China. Yeah. Literally. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. Nothing made in the USA. Not a. Yeah. Not a. I worked for a lot of uh, manufacturers uh, here um, in the uh, music business, electronics. Everything was made in in China and Japan. Every single product that we made, nothing was made here. And some stuff was assembled here, but everything was, you know, came from overseas. Every one hundred percent, and it didn't matter what it was. And I, I'll, I'll I'll leave you with this, and and thank you for the phone call, Donna. I'll leave you with yeah, this. No, I've, I've even lightened me. About three years ago, uh, uh, when we were looking to uh, uh, get some promotional stuff made, right for Fade to Black, and so we immediately, you know, the first things first, let's get some hats and T-shirts, right? And so I start mm-hmm. checking in. I consult with a couple of friends, even family members, you know. Uh, you know, what, what should we do? About, hey, man, you know, go to China. You know, we'll, we'll have the T-shirts printed over there. We'll have them shipped over here. They'll ship them for free, and, and they'll print and do these for a dollar each. You could do it here in the States for five bucks each. Or, and I'm thinking, how can we have the same shirt manufactured over there shipped here on a boat and arrive here and be that cheap. And you know what? We stopped. Rita and I seriously went, you know what? That's just, it doesn't even feel right to do that. So we have a local manufacturer that's literally, you know, right, you know, not down the street, but a couple of miles away. And they're done here in Los Angeles. They're manufactured here. We pay a little more, but we have a great quality and it's, it's a more expensive shirt. But it's here. It didn't feel right to me to have our T-shirts manufactured in Japan. I mean, in China and in and, and Foshan and, and sent over here for a dollar each, you know, just to make profit. That's not cool. It's just not cool. I'd rather lose money and, and do it here. And I'm telling you right now, I put my money where my mouth is. When I say this, I really do mean this. We chose to manufacture mm-hmm. here and we will always do that. So and that's I'm glad I just got one of your t-shirts. I love it. Oh, there you go. Does it fit? Does it look good? Uh, take, yeah, take, yeah. A, take a take a picture. Cute. Take a picture. Send it oh, in. Okay. But it, when I brought okay. that up with John about you know television sets, you know TV sets, you know something that was invented here, well, generally speaking, you know, and mm-hmm. how we dominated that and it fed our economy. I worked at Western Electric where. And you remember, Donna, uh, back in 1980, you didn't buy a phone. You leased your phone from the phone company, right? <laughs> every phone. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's hard that's, to remember that. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> and every phone, you had a choice of two, right? The prince's phone or the, <laughs> right? <laughs> or or the, uh, whatever the other one was called. And, you know, there was like three phones. A, B, or C, you chose beige, black, or white, right? I think they may even had Uh olive green. And that was it. And that was what was in every phone, uh, every home and office in the United States. And they were all manufactured here and they were built to last for 20 years. You know, this quality, uh, you know, you could drop those phones uh, out of a building and they would still work. Well, anyway, all of that is gone. 
You know, and if you think about that for a second, all of those manufacturing jobs that not only supported families and sent kids to school and put food on the table and 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 health insurance and all of that things that went along with it, but it was made in the United States, and we had pride and we it, and the quality and everything else made in the USA. You remember that made in the USA yeah. and and those American flag made in the USA tags. You remember. You can't even find them. They now we're even... just consumers, basically. They they trained us to be really good consumers. Well, and it's a... <laughs> but if we have we were out there on our own. I don't wonder what would happen when we're out there on our own. We don't, you know, you have to start from scratch again. A lot of people because we don't have know how to make things. You know what I would do? Yeah. You, you know how rowdy this is. This is radical. Go ahead. You can start sending the email now to Jimmy at JimmyChurchRadio dot com. I'll take it on the chin. <laughs> but listen. The, you know, all that cheap slave labor that they have over in China, you know, I, I, I mm -hmm. get that. Well, you know what? We have plenty of it here. It's called the prison system. <laughs> so oh, what I would God. do, this is what I would do. I would start a television <laughs> company. I would make 80-inch flat screen TVs, and I would, I would mm -hmm. go, and I would hire the prisoners, and I would pay those guys 50 cents an hour. And they would be happy to get it a dollar an hour. Yeah, they probably at least better they, than they would love day, it. Right? <laughs> they would love it. And and there's my slave labor. That's what I would do. If, yeah, if that, that's that, my that sounds win win actually. That's my <laughs> tip. That's my tip to the billionaires out there. Bring that manufacturing <laughs> back. Anyway, thank you for the call, Donna. And okay, uh, thanks, everybody Jimmy. can start sending the email now to Jimmy at JimmyTurtleRadio dot com. <laughs> thank you, Donna. You have a great, safe thank rest you. of your night, and we'll see you Friday night now. We're going to be oh, broadcasting yeah, from definitely. Roswell, so don't miss it. I won't. Okay. Th thank you so much. Donna out in Hawaii. Yeah, that's what I would do, man. I would I would hire the slave labor. Oh, so we've got the, uh, I, that's how long I've been yapping. I missed all of this. Who is posting the anonymous stuff here? Is that, that's Allison. Okay, Allison, you're going to get a retweet. Look at that. Anonymous. The voice of Anonymous will be here Wednesday. All right. Phone lines are open. Thank you for that phone call, Donna. 323-825-5045. And I want to get over to Roswell. Let's talk about this for a second. The, uh, the common thought, because Roswell is so big and so famous and so true, that's what we think of first when we think of 1947 and we think of Bell Labs too, right? The transistor. But it wasn't the only case. All right? 1947 was a crazy year for sightings and UFOs. And we think of Maury Island and we think of uh, Seattle, Tacoma, Washington. We think of that. Uh, the the bright and initiated will uh, remember the Rhodes photographs that are which are still stunning, um, which happened. I believe that was like in June 1947. Check this out. Let me hit this coffee because I'm about to yap. I want to get all of this in before the break. If you're on hold, stay right there. Three two three eight two five five zero four five. 1947. It all kicked off in January 1947 in England. At midnight, Ghost Plane X-362 makes its first appearance. RAF radar picked up something flying at 30,000 feet, speed of 400 miles an hour, and it continued to come back and come back. But that was in January 1947. Now check this out. I'm just going to bang these out. January 16th, 1947, North Sea. Another sighting. Uh, the next day, January 17th, 1947, another sighting in the North Sea. February 6th, 1947, in Port Augusta, Australia, another sighting. February 28th, 1947, six miles south of Lima, Peru, a very famous sighting. April 1947, Richmond, Virginia. May 5th, 1947, Seattle, Washington. Not what you're thinking. This was a silver object that was... Uh, spotted streaking across the sky by three witnesses. The object thought to have nosedive, and witnesses all thought that the object was most certainly going to crash. Okay? All right. Not Kenneth Arnold. Not Maury Island. May 17th, 1947, Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. 
the last week of May 1947 near Beaufort, South Carolina. June 2nd, 1947, in, in Roboth Beach near Lewes, Delaware. June 8th, 1947, five days later, 20 miles south of Malta. Fisherman Paulu Zamet and others on a boat 20 miles south of Malta were raising their nets when they saw a disc. And apparently little men, too, as well. June 12th, 1947, Weiser, Idaho. June 14th, two days later, 1947, Bakersfield, California. June 19th, 1947, Webster, Massachusetts. June 20th, Hot Springs, New Mexico. Yeah. June 21st, 1947, Spokane, Washington. Yeah. June 21st, 1947, Maury Island. June 24th, 1947, Pendleton, Oregon. June 24th, 1947, Richland, Washington. June 24th, the same day, 1947, Mount Rainier, Kenneth Arnold. June 24th, same day, Mount Adams, Washington. June 24th, 1947, Diamond Cap, Washington. June 24th, 1947, 10 to 12 miles east of Joliet, Illinois. Three days later, June 27th, 1947, Woodland, Washington. June 28th, 1947, 30 miles northwest of Lake Mead in Nevada. June 28th, Rockfield, Wisconsin. Same day, June 28th, 1947, Maxwell Air Force Base in Montgomery, Alabama. The next day, June 29th, 1947, Des Moines, Iowa. Also, same day, June 29th, 1947, Jacksonville, Oregon. Same day, June 29th, 1947, 20 miles east, northeast of Las Cruces, New Mexico. June 30th, 1947, near the south rim of the Grand Canyon in Arizona. Early July 1947, again, back in Malta in the Mediterranean. July 1st, 1947, Chitoy, Hokkaido, Japan. July 1st, same day, 1947, White Sands Missile Range. July 2nd, 1947, Roswell, New Mexico. Pharmacist Dan Wilmot, his wife and son Paul at home in downtown Roswell. A fireball came from the southeast directly or almost directly overhead, heading towards and disappearing over Six Mile Mountain at about an azimuth of 306 degrees northwest. Yeah, and that was reported in the Roswell Daily Record. July 3rd, 1947, San Diego, California. July 3rd, Roswell, New Mexico, the Roswell Crash. All of that happened. In 1947. Now, that was before Roswell. The entire year of 1947 was nuts. And this is Fade to Black. I am your host, Timmy Church. 323-825-5045. If you're on hold, stay right there. 323-825-5045. It's Fader Night. I want to hear from you. What are your thoughts on Roswell? What really happened? What do you think? You've heard all the stories. I'll be right back. Way out here, we listen to Jimmy Church. You're listening to Fade to Black. Always on the edge of the hottest alternative talk, Jimmy Church with Fade to Black. KGRARadio.com. ¿Qué tal mis amigos? Yo soy Mario Carzanel, tiburón Y los invito para que escuchen a mi buen amigo Jimmy Church Radio ¡Claro que sí! FoodforLiberty.com sells high-quality, storable foods from Numana. Whether you want to be prepared in the event of an emergency or an outdoor sports enthusiast, FoodforLiberty.com has your prepackaged single-serve packs or kits for the entire family. Numana is known for high-quality, great-tasting, GMO-free, super-nutritious food with no chemical preservatives. With a 25-year shelf life, you can't beat the feeling of being food secure when you need it most. Right now, FoodforLiberty.com 
Survivor.com is offering a special gift, a heavy-duty Survivor dry storage box designed for extreme bug-out conditions. This storage box is built to last, includes compass, signaling mirror, and is yours free with a $50 order. Go to foodforliberty.com right now and pick up your quality storable foods from Numana. To get the Survivor dry storage box, use promo code LIBERTY. It makes good sense to be prepared. Go to foodforliberty.com. Did you ever turn to your radio for your favorite talk show to find that it's been preempted for this? In the air, a deep right center. That goes Lewis to the wall, and it's all here! Or this? And I'm ashamed of you, Hillary, for voting for it. Do you have a favorite talk radio program that's not available in your city? Just go to TalkStreamLive.com for links to the best streaming talk radio shows. At TalkStream Live, you will find live talk shows 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. All your favorites are here. With such a large selection, you will also discover some new favorites. On the go and still want to listen? With the mobile smartphone, simply type TalkStream Live on your internet browser. Now you can take internet radio with with you. You will also find hundreds of music, news, and sports streams. Best of all, the TalkStream Live directory is free and there's never a login required. Remember TalkStreamLive.com, the fastest route between you and your favorite talk radio show. You are listening to Fate to Black with Jimmy Church on the Game Changer Network. Oi, oi, I'm Reese Evans. You're listening to Jimmy Church. This is Revolution. The Revolution will not be televised. The Revolution is on radio. Ciao. Welcome back, Fade to Black. Thursday night. Oh, I, did, I said it. Caught myself. It's Wednesday night, Fader night. 323-825-5045. Tomorrow night. Yeah, man, we're going to be on a plane. We don't get into Roswell. By the time we get to Roswell, it's going to probably be uh, midnight. And uh, there you go. I think uh, Friday morning, by the way, I will be... Uh, 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 early on, whatever the Roswell, uh, I, I forget the name of the show, but, uh, the, the AM radio morning program, I'm going to duck in there and, and, uh, say hello to Roswell. I, it's going to be so cool. And it's the same radio station actually that carries coast. So there you go. All right. So I'll be doing that Friday morning and then, uh, get set up. I cannot wait, uh, to meet everybody in Roswell. Uh, the town itself, which was interesting to me because I went and looked uh, to, you know, see where our hotel is and how close it is to the museum and, you know, planning th- things out. And there's like four streets, man. <laughs> Roswell is small. I don't know what the population is, but uh, it's going to be pretty cool to get there and see how they do this. I'm very excited. So uh, that's tomorrow night. And we're ready, too, by the way. We're We're just about done. I think we've got everything taken care of. All right, I'm opening up the phone lines. Let's, you know what? Let's just go. Let's just go. Hi, you're live on Fade to Black. Jimmy. Yes. Hi, it's Mark, Jimmy. Mark from Bridgeport. How you doing, man? Hey, Mark. How are you? I'm great, Jimmy. Thank you. Thank you for the great work you're doing. Yes, last night's uh, show with with Peter Lavender was amazing. I just love the connections he makes and the synchronicities he comes up with. So. So I got to listening to his stuff on YouTube today, and one of the things he said was that Sgt. Pepper's album was released 25 years to the day of the Roswell crash, 25 years later to the day of the Roswell well crash. And, of course, one of the lyrics in Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band is, 25 years ago today, 
that began, the band began to play Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. I thought it was, there, I don't know. There are, no, to me. <laughs> there are no coincidences, right? <laughs> I, sure, I know. I just love it, right? Yeah, that's, uh, that's, I've, I've heard that before, and I've heard uh, Peter talk about that. And that's one of those things that it, it if if there is a connection, right, it's one of those things that maybe we don't want to know. <laughs> right, it's just like <laughs> I know that. I know. I don't. If yeah, that, if, I know. I don't want to know anything <laughs> bad about the Beatles. Well, and, and, and it's just too freaky, right? It's just too freaky. It's I just, know, right? And let's just let that one simmer there for a minute, and yeah, <laughs> I, I remember hearing the same thing. Um, uh, there's there is one other bizarre fact uh, that that uh, about Roswell that it, to me is is completely fascinating. And I, I speak about it all the time because I need everybody to understand how serious this fact is. But in any of the references, books, magazines, radio programs, television, and everything that was done on ufology between 1947, you know, let's let's just go uh, a month after Roswell, right? A month after Roswell. From there until 1978 when the National Enquirer or the Star or whatever did their story on Roswell. And then after that, you know, the books started coming, you know, Burlitz and 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 Stanton Friedman and 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 uh William Moore and that stuff. And of course, later on Don Schmidt and Tom Carey. But up until then, that gap, there is no reference anywhere to Roswell. It doesn't exist. It doesn't wow. exist. Nobody talked about it. There, uh, uh, with all of you know, you know, when you think about Donald Kehoe, right, and John right. Keel and Alan Hynek, and just all of the researchers and uh, James McDonald, all of the guys that were studying this very, very seriously, um, no references to Roswell. Nobody, you know, and and these guys would go, and it's very important to understand exactly what I am saying. When you have, you know, Donald Kehoe, who I respect so much, just a brilliant mind, you know, and really, right. really wanted uh, this to be discussed in, in D.C. And a very respected guy, too, as well, right? And mm -hmm. and he would go and he would talk about Kenneth Arnold and he would talk about, uh, uh, you know, Tennessee and, and, and these different cases around the country. And what about this and this and this and that? But no Roswell. You know, that's how successful of a disinfo campaign and silencing that the military and the government was allowed to succeed with with Roswell because nobody talked about it. All of the, if you think about all of the magazines, right, F you know, Flying Saucer and Fate and, and all of these books and the sensationalism and Dell magazines and everybody that was putting out these Flying Saucer, you know, UFO magazines, no Roswell. They would talk about every single sighting and every case of this and that and, and go back and review these famous cases, but no Roswell. Now, what does they, that tell you? Now, you now that fits in with what you're talking about with Sergeant Peppers, because it wasn't supposed to exist. It didn't exist in pop culture. It didn't exist in any of the investigations. It wasn't brought up in blue. It wasn't out there, right? But how would they, the biggest band in the world, know about it and and tie that in? Could that be something from the inside? You know, stating this fact, you know, and, and what if, what if, uh, 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 25 years. Okay. So Roswell was 1947, 25 years. Ooh. And see what year did Sergeant Pepper come out? Well, they, he said it was 25 years to the day. Well, if it was 25 years to the day, then so it would be, it would be 42 Sergeant Pepper came out in 67, right? 68? Hmm. Hmm. It would be, nine, it would be 42. 69. Oh, it came out in 69. Okay, so. That sounds about right. Oh, no, it would be 1944. It wouldn't be 47. 
All right. If, if my math is right, somebody help me out here. No, 47 and 25 is 69. Oh, it was 20 years ago today, not 25 years ago today. Isn't the quote 20 years? Is it 20? What's the quote? Somebody I think ha- it's, that's a good, now you got me thinking. I, I, I haven't heard the song in so long. I think it's 25. Somebody, okay, here it is. 20 years ago today. Oh, 20 years. Okay, okay. so then it would be 1967. What year did... Uh, Sergeant Pepper release. 20. Okay. You see, 30, this is 67. Well, well, let's find out. Let's go to, uh, you know, there's a new thing. I don't know if you know about this. It's called Wikipedia. It's awesome. It's <laughs> going to be, it. yeah, yeah, it's going to be, source thing, right? <laughs> it's going to be huge. Oh, by the way, before I forget, anybody who has seen Bring Me the Head of Alfredo Garcia and mentions that on their radio show. You're you're my friend for life, dude. <laughs> it came out in 1967, and it came out. There you go. Okay, now it was released June 1st. Okay, all right. So it wasn't. Uh, it, it, it would have been trippy if it was July 3rd. Now, but that is in the UK. I don't have a United States release date. Mm. I'm looking here now for the United States release date. Okay, so let's look at, I want to look into this a bit more, but yeah, that's uh, pretty trippy. That is pretty trippy. Thank you for the phone call. Jimmy, thank you, man. No, and Keep thank you, and 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 the, the bring me the head of Alfredo Garcia. Anything Sam Peckinpah to me oh, is... Everybody is, needs to do like a Sam Peckinpah little mini festival at home. Uh, I, like, I, I swear. One, one, one year, uh, this is probably 10 or 15 years ago, Rita and I, we go to Amoeba Records, uh, which is a famous record store here in L.A. It's the last record <laughs> store in L.A. But they've got a great DVD uh, section, right? Used and, and new. And I went up and, and I went up to the uh, the kid and I said, uh, hey, man, I need to bring me the head of Alfredo Garcia. And there was something else, too. There was another peck and paw I was asking for. And the dude goes, hey, man, you're into Sam peck and paw? And I go, yeah. <laughs> he goes, man, we got a whole peck and paw section right over here. I was like, no nice. way. And we nice. went and, and you can ask Rita, man. We went blop, 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 and walked out with, you know, seven peck and paw films. And uh, and we we did a peck and paw week. But, yeah, I love Sam and 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 Chris Christopherson, that scene, that scene in Bring Me the Head, right, where they're off right. the side of the road and they're camping and the campfire is there. And yeah, the, yeah, yeah, yeah. And that scene where uh, Chris Christopherson is playing the biker is one of the most intense scenes ever in the history of cinema. Man, Sam Peckinpah, it's, man. It's fantastic. Thank you for really great movie. Yeah. See, that's why I love this audience because you guys get where I'm coming from. We're all from the same cloth. <laughs> yeah, man. Thank you so much. Have a great night, and we'll see. Right on, we'll yeah. see you on Friday from Roswell. You bet. Thank you, Jimmy. Yeah, thank you. Hi, you're live on Fade to Black. Hey, Jimmy. Hi. Hey, this is Kyle from Pennsylvania. Hey, Kyle. How are you? Okay, how are you doing? I'm doing good, um, man. You know, it's yeah, Wednesday. Talking, it's Wednesday I'm night. It's, it's Fader night, and tomorrow night we're going to be in Roswell. So pinch me, right? Am I dreaming? <laughs> you know, I've got two friends on Facebook that are both in Roswell right now that don't know each other. They were both been posting pictures from Roswell all week. I'm like, why are you guys down there? And now, like everybody I know is going to be in Roswell. <laughs> How did this happen? Yeah, um, it, yeah, and, and and you're not. So there you go. Uh, yeah, I'm on the East Coast. Yeah, next year. Um, next year. What's on your mind? Um, we were talking about 1947. I love 1947. I did like a whole article about 1947, and you put me to shame because you mentioned a lot of sightings that I hadn't even heard about. I'm gonna have to go research them now. But the one thing that I really like about 1947 is when everything kicked into high gear at the beginning of the year, you know what happened later that year? What's that? On September 18th, the National Security Act went into effect. Oh, yes, 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 yeah, yeah. We created the United States Air Force. 
That's right. The National Security Council and the CIA. Mm-hmm. Coincidentally, the same year that these UFO sightings go off the chart. Absolutely. <clears throat> Absolutely. Yeah. And have you Coincidentally. S- have you seen uh, the Rhodes photographs that were taking? Uh, oh, t- yeah. I posted those on the, on the article, yeah. I, I, it's s- great. Still, to this day, those creep me out. I don't yeah. know what we're looking at here. And it, it, you know, somebody, I remember, this is probably 20 years ago, I was reading stuff on the Rhodes case, and somebody goes, dude, it's a leaf. I'm like, it's a leaf. <laughs> you know, I started out, Life magazine, when I was a little kid, did an article about UFOs, and they had a ton of color pictures, and the picture, I can't remember the name of it now, but the black and white one where it's over the farmhouse, it's kind of at an angle. And, uh, McMinnville. Just, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. They had all those pictures in there, and I remember reading that, and that is what what kicked me on UFOs. And I've, that's been like a lifelong thing, and I've, I've tried to stay on top of them and, and read as much about them. But what gets me is I love the old UFO sightings, the ones where they have radar. They pick them up on radar. They send fighters up to intercept. They get visual confirmation. You've got visual confirmation from air from the uh, fighter pilots. You've got radar confirmation on ground, and sometimes ground observers at the same time. To me, those are better than you can take videos all day long and fake them. But to me, if you've got radar confirmation, fighter pilot confirmation, and ground observer confirmation, that's that's a pretty good sighting. And and back in. The, they, had on. they had a lot of those. They, they did. They did. And they were scrambling. And see, this is this is one of the things that's interesting about that era. Back then, I you know, I don't know how often it happens today. But back then, you knew everything that was in the sky, right? Yeah, and yeah. And so when something popped up on radar that, and also everything was really slow. Okay, Prop, mm-hmm. props yeah. and, you know, jets were very, very, very rare. And they weren't that fast. They were a little faster. But when something was traveling at 500 miles an hour, that might as well have been light speed to those guys, right? And so 1,000 yeah. miles an hour on radar, that, now we've got a problem. And they would scramble <laughs> jets, I mean, uh, scramble planes every single time something happened. You know, and yeah. that and that's really the truth. They, they it was yeah. it was something that was up there, and they went and scrambled. You know that Mansiel thing. You know where they blamed on uh, Venus. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yep. And that that's a case that still to this day uh, kind of uh, creeps me out because he described well, it as metallic, and for everybody to say, "Oh, you know, that's Venus." You know what? Venus. Yeah. I, I think he knew the difference. Uh, yeah. Uh, there was a uh, one of the uh, famous British pilots. I can't remember his name at the moment now, but he was a test pilot, one of the greatest uh, pilots they ever had, chased a UFO once. And uh, this guy, I mean, this guy was like a legend in British aviation. And he chased a UFO. And when he landed, he was like, I don't know what it was. And for this guy <laughs> who was like a legend to, to get out of his plane and go, I don't know what I was chasing. You know, that's that, that's something. Um, but you were talking about radar contacts. If you read, like, a lot of those old radar kind of contacts, they would pick up a UFO, and the thing would zip across the, the radar screen. I mean, ungodly speed. You're talking, like, Mach, what, Mach 5, Mach 6, just, you know, it was gone. Well, um, I, I had nothing that would do that. I, I went out with a friend of mine, uh, somebody that I grew up with, his name's Steve, and mm-hmm. we went out, and he's a pilot, so we grab his plane, and we fly, flew out uh, and around the Malibu base, right, and took some pictures and shot some video. And so uh, while we were out there, all I was doing, it's different when you're in a private plane as opposed to a, you know, a commercial aircraft where you just got that little window that you can look out. But when you're uh-huh. in a private plane, you got a 360 degree view, right? And all I did, man, my head was on a swivel. I was just constantly scanning the skies. And so, and I asked him, I said, dude, have you ever seen 
you know, anything strange. And he goes, you know what? Only once. And uh, I still don't know what it was. It might have been a meteor, but this bright light came from my left and just streaked across the front of uh, the windscreen out in front of the plane and continued uh, to the right. And it was just a, a streak of light. I was like, really? He goes, yeah, now I, I you know, it didn't look like a flying saucer. It didn't look like anything, but it was just a ball of light. And it just, phew, just shot fast. And I said, how fast? He said, dude, dude, it was just like, phew. and I said, so what'd you do? And he goes, man, I called uh, air traffic control. And I said, have you guys, did you guys see anything? Because I, this thing, this light just flashed past me and they didn't have anything on the radar and nothing in the area. So I don't yeah. know if they track meteorites and meteor, you know, I don't know if they do, if they, I, I assume they would have the ability to do that, but he said well, he reported it. I don't know that. Yeah. I, I was <laughs> looking too, man. I was so looking. I wanted to see something. <laughs> Did not. You know, it's, so much stuff has happened. There, like the, the battle of Los Angeles. Yes. Yep. Like that. I mean, you know, that's like, you start reading about that. And yeah, you've got the you know, you know everybody's like no, it was nothing. You know, like nothing. Uh, you yeah. guys were firing artillery in the air. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, and I, I, for, eyewitnesses. Yeah, I forget how many and, shots they fired, but you know, let's just it's. Let, I can safely say they fired like fifteen hundred or two thousand rounds. You know, at yeah. you know from different points here in L.A. And at that time in L.A., which makes the Battle of Los Angeles so interesting for me was we were on a definite war footing with Japan and we were expecting, you know, everybody, it was all points on, you know, turning off your lights at night and, you know, and, and, and all of that. Well, anyway, they, uh, they knew what they were looking for, right? They were looking for this invasion. They were also looking for submarines and they were looking uh, for other stuff uh, along the West coast, but they were waiting and for that thing to happen and not being able to shoot it out of the sky, even if it was an observation balloon, after 1,500 sure. rounds of anti-aircraft, you know, and flak, it would have come down. And it didn't. And it stayed up there and moved down the coast. It moved south down the coast um, uh, a ways down uh, closer to Long Beach and then and then left. You know, and that yeah. that's a very interesting sighting. There's one picture, if you can grab it, there's, uh, if you can, it, it's hard to find, but if you find the original picture that was used for the LA Times article, because the LA Times article, <laughs> that's a, uh, that's newsprint. So it's pixelated, right? It's, it's, yeah. it's turned into a halftone. But if you, if you can find the original photograph out there, there is a definite, diamond shaped craft that's lit up in the spotlights. You can't see it so much in the front page of the LA times, but if you look at the original photograph, which I, I have it somewhere on a hard drive and you take a look at that, there is a definite shape up there that you don't see in the original LA times print. Well, the thing here says that it was a 50 caliber machine gun rounds and 1,400 12.8 anti anti-aircraft artillery shell, 12.8 pounds anti-aircraft artillery shells. So, yeah, they opened up on that thing. Yeah, they did. But, um, I'll tell you something else that's fascinating about the Battle of Los Angeles people don't talk about. A lot of people died, but they died of heart attacks. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, well, yeah, you were talk we're talking about Kenneth Arnold. When I first started researching Kenneth Arnold, you know, I was like, okay, Kenneth Arnold. But no, when you look, the people all in that area saw something. There were a lot of ground sightings. There was a lot of there saw, were there were saw. sightings. There were sightings, like I had said, um, in Washington uh, earlier on in the show, all over Washington. I mean, there was a lot of sightings, and on top of that, you had Maury Island. Oh yeah, 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 and Chrisman, Fred Chrisman. Yeah, Fred Chrisman, and, uh, Ray Palmer, and. Yeah, I guess that that was freaking out. You know, actually, on a side note here, you know Ray Palmer that did a lot of the weird tales or uh, that pu published a lot of uh, Christmas stuff. Yep. Uh, do you know Ray Palmer was actually 
the DC comic book character that Adam was named after him. Yeah, that's right. That's right. <laughs> yeah, his name was Ray Palmer. Yeah, that's and right. And Ray Palmer was actually short. Well, and the, the when you and I'm glad that you went and started listening to uh, Peter Lavenda stuff because Guy Bannister and Fred Crisman and that crew from mm-hmm. Maury Island and uh, the way that uh, uh, the the reason why Lavenda even as, associated the UFO stuff is just because he was chasing these FBI agents and Mm -hmm. was getting their documents. And that's, that's how they were tied into UFOs. It wasn't the other way around, you know, that Lavenda Mm -hmm. was looking into the UFO subject and then, you know, finds guy, you know, finds guy Bannister, you know, that's not how it happened. It was the opposite direction because he was looking into other stuff, the secret space program, the paranormal stuff, uh, JPL and, and what was going on with Alistair Crowley and, and and so forth. So uh, he's yeah, he's JPL, and, and, um, and the nine, the nine. So he's putting all of that together, and that's when he started to stumble into you know Fred Chrisman and and Guy Bannister and it's Jack Parsons. And, uh, Jack Parsons. It's no coincidence yeah. that Guy yeah. Bannister and Fred Chrisman, who are you know uh, part of the JFK circle, right, uh, right, right, documented, right. but they were there at all of these key events in American history going back to Maury Island. And and Maury Island, let's not forget, that was also the first UFO-related deaths, too, as yeah, well. Yeah, and it was a really weird story when you read it. I mean, you're like, wow, that's... I mean, it's not like your normal... I saw a light in the sky that moved across. This was like a ship in trouble and weaving, and, you know, the other ship comes... Yeah, it's really... What do you th- so? What do you think about Roswell? I mean, what's the bottom line? There's all of this, uh, you know. There's all the documentation and writing and research that that you could ever want. But well, now th- that you've done all of this, what do you think happened out at Roswell? I think well, another thing you just blew my mind on a few minutes ago because I have never made the connection at all. You're right. There was a blackout period of Roswell. Because, yeah, I remember reading all of this Mothman Chronicles, you know, and going through all this stuff, and and uh, uh, ballet and all, all this stuff. There's no mention of Roswell. Nope. Doesn't exist. That, that is mind-blowing. I had never realized that. Yeah, before. I think everybody needs to really chew on that and digest that. That's pretty wild. I never, never, I was like, as soon as you said that, I was like, Holy crap, he's right. Yep, yep. They never mentioned Roswell. Never. Nope. But it's not. And it's see, I, but see, this is the thing, Kyle, and I'm going to have to let you go. We're going to hit a break here. But this is the thing. Okay. It's not like Roswell wasn't talked about. It was on the radio. It was front mm-hmm. page news. The press releases were there. That, it, But after that, I mean, after that, uh, the information is there. But after that, silence. And they were very, very successful in removing that from pop culture. And we can, yeah, I, well, I need everybody to understand exactly how serious uh, that is. They had to keep everything quiet because they were busy reverse engineering all the alien technologies that they found. Well, and they also I'm, had to. They had firmly also, convinced they did that. I'm sorry. Well, I'm they, firmly convinced. They yeah, that. and they had to practice the art of disinfo. You know, and that's that's yeah. really the truth. And. And the the uh, the practice for that was Roswell, you know, and what they like learned from right. Roswell, you know. So there you go. Thank you, Kyle, and uh, we'll see you, you. We'll see you Friday night from Roswell. Okay, take it easy. Have a great night. You too. This is Fade to Black Fader Night Open Lines three two three eight two five five zero four five. I will never see. I will always allow the conversation to finish. I'd rather do that than take 80 phone calls. I'll be right back. Hi, everybody. This is Rob Halford, the Metal Guard, on JimmyChurchRadio.com. KGRA Radio. Intelligent Talk. 
So, you love talk radio, then you'll love TalkStreamLive.com. TalkStream Live is always on, 24-7, with the best streaming talk shows. Find your favorite talkers and discover some new ones. It's free, readily available online, or on any smartphone or tablet. Finding your favorite talk shows all in one place has gotten a whole lot easier. Just go to TalkStreamLive.com. Be sure to download the free apps from Google Play or the iTunes App Store. Would you like freedom from health insurance? You're not alone. Whether you're self-employed, a small business owner, or an individual who purchases health care for yourself and your family, Liberty Health Share could be the answer. Liberty Health Share has united a community of like-minded people that actually share health care costs. And Liberty Health Share members are exempt from IRS penalties associated with the Affordable Care Act. Imagine freedom from insurance. You choose your own doctor and hospital. Your medical provider simply submits your bills to to Liberty Health Share for processing. Why wait? You do have choices. Together we're changing health care for good. Find out more and get a free monthly estimate right now. For a limited time, use promo code TALK to save $50 when you enroll. Go to libertyhealthshare.com forward slash options. That's libertyhealthshare.com forward slash options. Hi, I'm Richard Dolan. When I'm not hosting my radio program, The Richard Dolan Show on KGRA, or writing new books on UFOs, I run a publishing company. I'm proud to say that Richard Dolan Press has published some of the most fascinating books available on UFOs and related subjects. They include Dr. Bruce Maccabee's classic analysis of the UFO cover-up, David Marler's breakthrough book on triangular UFOs, Dr. Richard Souter's unique work on underground bases, and other classics by Grant Cameron, Chase Kletsky, and Dr. Bob Wood. Not to mention intriguing works by Eve Lorgan and Laurie McDonald that deal with truly bizarre phenomena. I'm proud to publish such high quality and original works, and there are several amazing books about to be released over the next few months. Go to richarddolanpress.com to learn more. Did you know that when you're on the road with limited data or Wi-Fi available, you can still listen to every minute of Fade to Black by just calling 605-562-4482. No smartphone, app, or internet needed. It saves your data plan and no extra cost if you have unlimited minutes. Just call 605-562-4482. You can listen to me, Jimmy Church, on any phone, anytime, anywhere. Go back, Lee Tappy. You want to know a secret? I love ponies. I really love ponies. I'm serious. I couldn't stay sane without ponies to brush. Why fade to black? Because you never got that pony. Damn it. This is Fade to Black with Jimmy Church on the Game Changer Radio Network and KGRA, the Global Radio Alliance. Welcome back to Fade to Black. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Follow me on Twitter right now, at JChurchRadio. Hashtag F2B is the sandbox. I'm just sitting here watching the chat rooms. You guys are out of control. And Twitter, just thank you for all of that. And it's uh, it's the weekend. It is the Roswell weekend. 323-825-5045. It is so important I'm, I'm watching Twitter. What? My mind is blown. It was a Roswell blackout. Oh, yeah. Oh, listen, one of the coolest things that you can do if you are a fan of late night talk radio, right? You're a fan of this show. Go after the show tonight and search Long John Neville. That's what you want to do. N-E-B-E-L. Long John Neville. And click on video in Google, and you're going to see his talk show pop up. And I, t- I talk about it all the time, but it's 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 part of uh, talk radio history. It's 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 talk radio 101. Long John Neville broadcasted from, I believe, and I should know this, but I just want to make sure, midnight 
till 6 a.m. Now, that's overnight talk radio. His show didn't start until midnight, and it was called The Party Line. And what Long John would cover was everything. Uh, ghosts, the paranormal, UFOs, uh, all, all, all of that stuff that uh, uh, we talk about today. But he did it for six hours, and and he did it, I think he did it six nights a week. Six times six is 36. And he would tell everybody 37 and a half hours of talk radio per week. Crazy schedule that this guy did. But he had millions and millions of listeners, and he broadcasted out of Manhattan, New York City. And so what he would do is he would bring on uh, the party line. He would have three, four, five guests live in the studio that would sit around a table, and they all had their own microphones, and they would sit and talk and have a conversation. And uh, he would have on, when when they would talk about the subject of UFOs, he would have Otis Carr, he would have Arthur C. Clarke, you know, and, and they would sit at Donald Kehoe, Sit. Uh, Kenneth Arnold was on a show a bunch of times. And so they would sit and talk about UFOs, the current news, the sightings. They would always be talking about Congress and Washington, D.C. and and the Department of Defense and, and how they dealt with things. And now go and pick a show. And now he broadcasted from the mid-50s all the way through 1974 until he died. Then his wife uh, picked up and uh, continued the broadcast until she passed away. Um, but anyway, and she was also, she was an MK Ultra. What was her name? Candy Clark, Candy Kane. Ah, I can't remember her name. But anyway, uh, you can go and everything is archived on the web. Go and pick a show. Pick a year. It doesn't matter. And they sit and analyze and talk for hours on end about every famous case and sighting and what the the saucers and the crafts looked like, what they were made from, the Nazi technology. They went into every aspect of the subject. He was the guy, and there is not one mention on any of John Nebel's shows about Roswell. And the way that they cover everything, and they do the inner earth, and, and uh, they just get into everything. Antarctica, they'll talk about Admiral Byrd. They talk about Project Paperclip. They talk about everything. The rocket programs, the V2s, the, the ghost rockets, they cover everything. Not one mention of Roswell. And I have sat and I've listened to um, every show that I can of of Long John's listen to uh, many of them many times uh, over. The Arthur C. Clarke one is amazing, by the way. And that was 1960. Go and listen to that. Not one mention of Roswell. And And you have to ask yourself, how can that be? Because he's got all the brightest and best researchers and writers and publishers of books and magazines. They're all on the show. And Roswell was something that was documented, okay? Not only not only through newspapers, but but radio, and it it hit the wires. It went national. It was a real report. No mention of it. And when you hear Nebel, the way that he covers all every angle of the subject of flying saucers and UFOs, that the one thing that would amplify and kick off everything for him and his guest w would have been Roswell. And it's simply not there. And so don't, don't take my word for it. Never believe me. Go and listen for yourself. Now I just went and checked. Uh, there wasn't a sighting, uh, or UFO report for June 1st, 1947, uh, which is the release date in the UK. Of Sergeant Pepper. So somebody, uh, I don't know if you guys printed uh, or tweeted it out about uh, uh, another release date for Sergeant Pepper. You know, the one I want to find is July 3rd, 1947. But on June 2nd in 1947, 
in in Rehoboth Beach near Luz, Delaware, pilot Forrest Wenyon was in his aircraft flying north at 1,400 feet. Now, this is uh, a month before Roswell. Saw a silvery jar-shaped object uh, about 15 inches in size cross in front of his plane at somewhere between 1,000 and 10,000 miles per hour heading east on a straight course at the same altitude with a silver-white fire exhaust. Now, could it have been a daytime meteor? Don't know. All right? it's uh, That's an interesting sighting. That was on June 2nd, 1947. Now, would that have been... June 1st, 1947, in the UK. <laughs> Let's go to the phones. Hi, you're live and Fade to Black. Good evening. Uh, that is that is interesting, and we we get to the bottom of things. There are about nine or ten things I could talk to you about as usual, but I'll keep it to a couple. Um, before I ask you about Roswell and what you're going to do, uh, Jimmy, I wanted to just, I know with it, you and me, and we all love Stephen Bassett, some disagree that he is being effective. But earlier this week, you had mentioned that, you know, maybe a lot of the stuff that comes out isn't because he's there in Washington, um, you know, lobbying. But I, I think that, I think I disagreed with you on that. I, I do think that, um, uh, just the very fact that uh, that uh, Clinton's talking about it and that Jimmy Kimmel and and now if you follow uh, the Paradigm Research uh, page, there have been some news articles, actual real media in, in England and elsewhere starting to pick up on it. So I think he has been, had some effect. Okay, that's fine. And I'm not saying that he doesn't, but I, I will say this, and I uh, I respect Stephen greatly. Um, and I, I spoke to him two weeks ago. He was over in London coming over to Canada to do the uh, big presentation up there. Um, so, you know, I respect Stephen. But um, my point about Stephen uh, that I've always made uh, when, when people disagree with his methodology, right, is what, 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 what other choices are better? You know what? You would rather have him not do anything. It's like SETI. You know why are we wasting time with SETI? What? We, you'd rather we don't do SETI? That just sounds stupid to me. So you need to have uh, uh, Stephen with his approach. You need to have uh, Leslie Kane with her approach. You need to have Stephen Greer with his approach. And they're all different, and they 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 look at things differently. And and. Uh, that kind of three, four, five pronged approach is what you need to have. You need to keep your foot on the gas. Now, it are is Washington speaking up because of of Greer or Kane or or Bassett? I, I'm going to say this right now. Probably not. You know, but it's better than nothing. And is it effective? I don't know. But it's 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 like when you've got to take broad spectrum antibiotics to kick out something in your body that they can't figure out. Well, you know what? You hit them with everything. And then hopefully it's the shotgun approach, right? You shoot in the dark yeah. <laughs> and hopefully, yeah. hopefully you're going to hit something. It's, it's, it's like that. I mean, yeah, I, I think that, that, that you're right. And if we don't know, but if there is even this small cabal or group that's keeping secrets, we definitely need a multimodal approach to get anything out of them until the walls come crumbling down, so to speak. Well, um, and look, no matter what, no matter bleeping what, whether ET is here and has made contact or not, um, uh, I have my own opinions. Whether we have made contact uh, intentionally, uh, uh, whether we have. Uh, uh, you know, procured a craft, a crash craft, traded a craft, traded astronauts, Project Serpo, whatever, whatever that information is, I can tell you right now that whatever they know, they haven't talked to us about. They know something. I, I don't know what that something is, Dino. I, I don't know. 
I don't know, but I can tell you this much. What they do know, they haven't let us know. And that's a fact. That's a fact. It's a 100% fact. You can bank on it. Yeah, I mean, I'd have to say, I mean, and that that clears you, I guess, for a couple of folks that thought you were a, a mis- disinfo agent because you don't know. <laughs> so well, I... if you did, if you were an agent, you'd be telling us some false stuff. But uh, you know what's been bothering me a lot lately? I I happen to be searching YouTube recently, and remember a few couple of years ago back in England the two quote-unquote Swedish sisters that were detained and then ran out into traffic, got hit by trucks. Yep, yep, I've seen, I've seen the video many times. That, that still bothers me, and I, I can't seem to, I went to look at a follow-up video, and it was unavailable, and it still makes me wonder about Dolan's attractive, you know, <laughs> alien, you know, attractive ETs. I mean, who were those women, and what's going on? I mean, they were like super women. You know, they fought the police off after they got hit. They karate chopped them. They went running. I really want to know what they were. Were they super soldiers? It still bugs me, and I've heard nothing else about it. I can answer that for you right now. I'm not 100% certain, but I'm going to go with 99.9. Meth heads. Yeah, but the one had her leg. The one sister got hit by a truck, and her leg was sticking out and and. and and they she couldn't keep still. And I mean, it's, everybody says so, that's what they say about everything is drugs. But, but I mean, they no, said that about Travis Walton. So high on meth, man, and and the adrenaline and and the speed running through their veins. They've been up for a week. You know, I I I, I I've seen that video a few times. Trying to go with, uh, uh, you know, an MK Ultra mind control situation. Could that be what was going on? You know, I understand that angle, um, but the one sister went, this is the thing, this is where it was the key, why it was drugs to me. She went into, went to jail, dried out, and and got her mind back, and she was totally normal. She oh, left. I didn't. I hadn't heard that. So that's a no. Fact. Watch that's the not- watch the documentary. They she goes to jail. They check her into jail. So anyway, when she's released. She uh, winds up at a bar, goes home with this guy, and she's there with him for a couple of days, and they're doing drugs. And what happens? She kills him and then goes out into the street, and and she's lost her mind again. She's high on meth. Oh, gee, they were in such good shape. They looked so super athletic. I mean, they had two or three or four people holding them, and they were just, even the cops said they had super strength and they could punch and fight. It, it just seems a shame to be in such good shape and, you know, and to, to, to do drugs that way. It just, again, I hope it's not a disinfo. You, that really did happen. I didn't hear the end of that. Nah, it was, you know, I'm just saying uh, that that's, that it was all the psychosis that was involved and 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 the things that they were saying and doing and the superhuman strength, you know, it, PCP, meth, both, staying up for a week, you've lost your mind. So well, that, they were family. They, they, they backed each other up. Well, on something a little bit more positive, so are you going to do something special that we've never heard of in Roswell on Friday? I mean, is there is there some person we haven't heard about that's going to come forth is there some new evidence you have uh i i if if, dino if there was would i say it right now no you wouldn't so there you go and any secret you have is good with me but i keep waiting (laughs) for some stuff to happen (laughs) i i think stuff you know look man after uh after contact in the desert you know i'm through man i i don't need any 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 more stuff to happen i'm kind of cool right now i'm serious (laughs) man i i nearly had a heart attack that was uh that was a trippy thing if you would have seen me there I'm telling you right now, I, I I bent over and put my hands on my knees and, and had to, I was hyperventilating. That was a trippy, uh, the the star, not the, the green orb, but the star that moved over my head and disappeared. I was like, wait, wait. <laughs> well, I, we could all see on the remote uh, just Rita's reaction. I mean, she was stunned. What remote? Oh, the oh, the, uh, oh, yeah, yeah. See, and look, I didn't even know that that was going on. And uh, I was just in a zone. 
and uh you know because they had the cameras or whatever you know running but that was all going on in the background and i didn't see that it was it was it was a while later that i i kind of absorbed that we were doing this live feed or they were doing a live feed i had no idea man well that's okay it was authentic we got the authentic you the authentic rita so there's i'm not complaining i'm just saying we could see the emotion even come through a, a digital media. Okay? Yeah, it was so. fun. What was really telling about that was I did go and see a clip, and the clip was uh, Rita and I. We had just pulled up in our in our car, and we were walking in, and somebody says something to me, and all that came out of my mouth was, "I need a shot of vodka." <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I was, I was, I was, I just needed to just sit. And collect my thoughts, man, because it was it was pretty dramatic. Somebody posted, um, uh, somebody sent me a post uh, that said, you know, Jimmy, we're tired of hearing about your sighting at contacting the desert for a hundredth time. And you know what? You know what my answer to that is? Dude, you're jealous. You know, that's it. Yeah. Because if anybody, uh, that's why this is this is what's really trippy about it. I've I've said what I've said, but everybody that was there, look at what happened with uh, Facebook and Twitter and and everybody talking about uh, you know what they saw. I wasn't the only one that was was talking about this publicly. It was no, a no. it was a crazy thing to see, and it 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 really happened. No, no, I disagree with that criticism because whether it's Travis Walton or, or Betty and Barney Hill. I mean, the thing that I loved about when I was at Contact in the Desert and what Peter Lavenda, you've got to have him on again, no matter how many times you've heard the story, if you have interaction with people, and I can ask questions, like I asked Travis something once about the interior of the craft, and I don't think he'd ever talked about the way it looked. And, and with you or anybody else, each time you recount it, if people can ask you, well, did you see this, this, and this, new information or new insights can come out. Well, I, I, yeah, I've thought about that a lot, and I, I have. There's nothing more that I can add. I, I, there's no, there's no color commentary here. There's nothing that I can add. That's it. I saw what I saw is exactly how I've described it, and it, it was actually a very simple sighting. It was very simple. There was nothing extraordinary i don't have any lights on the craft to describe there was no windows there was no et's waving at us no cattle mutilations happened nothing landed there was no missing time uh that i know of uh there there's nothing there it was simply these objects that were were seen and th that's that's it there's nothing else to it there's nothing yeah, else in your I case there probably isn't and there was a group but but if you ask somebody else who was watching across the valley at the same time and the fact that you've come forward they feel comfortable talking about it they might have seen a different perspective or point of view and and then the people i just mentioned too they they had a much more complex you know, close encounter interaction. So that's what I'm saying is that anytime you hear a story over and over again and a person has experienced it, sometimes you can jar a memory that they didn't have. Anyhow, that being said, are you going to have Schmidt back you up there? Is he going to co-host with you? Who, Don? Yeah. Uh, only if he's, you know, using the right hair products. <laughs> I mean, it just seems like a natural that he would be there because he has so much information on that. I, I love talking to him the chance that I had. So anyway, I will uh, will let you go, but uh, I, I will be listening on Friday, and I hope that you'll bring something interesting into it that uh, you know that we haven't heard before. Well, what what I'm what I'm most excited about. First off, I just love to speak in and and do live broadcasts in front of people because there's an interaction that happens there and there's a vibe. So I'm just into that adrenaline rush. So I'm excited about that. But what I'm most looking forward to is meeting the people out there, not only uh, the, uh, the people from out of state and out of town that are going to be attending, but the people of Roswell themselves. And they all live in Roswell for a reason and uh, not necessarily UFO related, but, you know, there's but I, I, I cannot wait to go and hang out with everybody. Yeah, in Roswell. We, we got it. We got to have you do a Gobekli Tepe 
for the memory of uh, Edgar Mitchell, since that was his hometown, and you got to go do it at the Ailey Inn. <laughs> well, the, well, the Ailey Inn is in, uh, that's uh, Rachel, Nevada. That's Area 51. Oh, oh, okay. I thought that was over there. No, 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 that, no, but um, uh, uh, I just got, uh, oh, I wanted to, uh, before we hit the break, I do, I do want to go back and touch upon something that you just said. And it's, I have gotten so much email from people that were at Contact in the Desert from a different vantage point, right? They were at yeah. another location, and that, but saw everything that I saw too as well. And they were, you know, at a different vantage point and weren't seeing it with night vision and so forth. Um, and that's pretty cool to get that feedback out there. One, the reason why it's cool is that people are listening and they're listening to what I'm saying and they are able to go back and go, yeah, you know what? We saw the same thing. This is Jimmy's description and he's very on point and very, you know, uh, uh, descriptive about exactly what he saw. And then they are able to tie that in to what they saw. And I've gotten so much, uh, feedback. It's just been great. So I, I wanted to, uh, uh, hit that. The other thing is I got email uh, right before the show tonight. Um, I, I think her name is, I think it's Linda. And if she's listening right now, thank you for the email, Linda. I think I responded back, but she goes, you got to go to this restaurant. And, <laughs> she, <laughs> and she, she listened. She said we were in Roswell two weeks ago and somebody recommended this Mexican restaurant. You've got to go there. So I have it. And see, that's what I'm talking about. I can't wait yeah. to just go out and hang out. So there you go. Well, okay. We'll send plenty of pictures and uh, keep the lines clear after the break for Brandon. He's going to call in. Okay. All right. They are not branded. But that, this show has become such a phenomenon in just over two years, and we're headed higher. We're almost at 18,000 uh, followers just on Spreaker. Oh, is that right? When we get to 20, we're going to have a big celebration because then you're going to be number two. Well, you know, that's what's really funny is you have, you know, you have 20,000 here, 20,000 here, you know, 8,000 here. You know, these different feeds that we send out there. And, and at the end of the day, you add up these numbers and I and I look at it and I'm just like, holy crap. You know, it, it's pretty cool. Some days are higher, some days aren't. But And the other thing is, you know, you had that 17,000 number that's there. I guess you're talking about Spreaker. That's yeah. that's just the followers. That's not who's listening to the show. The number, exactly. You know, some days, uh, you know, where we hit just on one account, you know, one feed, 90,000, you know, 92,000. It's pretty cool to, uh, you know, 108,000. And just from one feed, it's pretty it's it's pretty humbling to see these numbers. But. It's you. We've become a phenomenon all together. But you're the leader, and uh, no, nah, it's the uh, look. Never forget everything that I just said. That's the audience that makes this show. You know that's that's it. And 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 also uh, Sam Peckinpah. Have a good night. <laughs> Have a good I'm night. I'm feeling Dino. very bespoke tonight. Have a good trip. We'll be listening. Thank you so much, Dino. And, uh, yeah, the, the contact in the desert, when, uh, when we came back that Monday and I was recounting the events of the evening or the weekend, and don't forget it was Saturday and Sunday night because we had the sightings on Sunday night too, as well at the Fader house is, um, I think I really believe that that night Saturday and Sunday, but that night Saturday is going to be talked about for years to come. That was a mass sighting. That wasn't just a couple of people. That was a mass sighting. And it's going to be, it's, it's, it, that was one for the books. I'm going to go ahead and take a break right here. This is Fade to Black. It's Fader Night, but it's Wednesday. 323-825-5045. I'll be right back.
You are listening to my boy, Jimmy Church, on JimmyChurchRadio.com. Despite popular opinion, reading a book will not make you smarter. But listening to Jimmy Church will. Does your basement or crawl space have a damp, musty smell? Well, watch out. That's a sign of too much moisture and not enough ventilation. And that can mean increased mold growth and the buildup of harmful toxins and gases. Don't bother with a dehumidifier. It just circulates the same unhealthy air. Now there's a better way to remove these dangers and odors. It's with the computerized wave ventilation unit that reduces moisture and expels pollutants. We replaced our old dehumidifier with the wave unit, and in only three weeks, our basement is dry and the musty smell is gone. Wave ventilation requires no maintenance, no buckets of water or filters, and costs only pennies a day to run. Breathe better, live healthier with an affordable, no maintenance wave ventilation unit. Call 888-618-WAVE 888-618-WAVE or visit MyDryHome.com MyDryHome.com Ride the wave Wave home solutions for a healthy, comfortable home What's up, Fade or Nots? Studio Dumb loves Fade to Black and the F2B audience so much that they have put together the ultimate stereo Bluetooth system. They've done it just for you. Man, check this out. The Studio Dome SBB2 stereo system is here. It's featuring two Studio Boombox 2 SBB2 wireless Bluetooth speakers packed in its own custom hard shell case. This Studio Dome system features the very latest in stereo Bluetooth technology. The two full-range boomboxes are in true wireless stereo. You've got to hear this. It's amazing. It's just $129, and use the promo code JCRTWS, and you'll also get free shipping. It's simple. Just go to JimmyChurchRadio.com, click on the Studio Dome banner. Go back, Lee Tappy. It's not a lifestyle we chose. We were born this way. KGRARadio.com This is KJCR at JimmyChurchRadio.com Welcome back to Fade to Black. It's Wednesday night, Fader night. 323-825-5045. Talking about Roswell. I can't believe nobody wanted to talk about Hoder and the time travel paradox in Game of Thrones. It was right there for everybody. I just, that kind of blows my mind. Uh, anyway, yesterday, Scottish MP Natalie McGarry tweeted her disgust with Donald Trump's illegal email to the Scottish Parliament members asking for campaign donations. Now, I've seen copies of the email. It really happened. It's hilarious. The email came from Donald's son, Donald J. Trump Jr., and McGarry responded with a repulsion saying, among other things, and I'm quoting here, Quite why you think it appropriate to write emails to UK parliamentarians with a begging bowl for your father's repugnant campaign is completely beyond me. End quote. I've seen the emails. Brutal. And, and the tweets. Apparently, all elected officials in Scotland, Australia, Iceland, and the United Kingdom were all hit with the illegal fundraising emails. One member of the UK Parliament took to the floor of the House of Commons to ask all of the emails from Donald Trump be blocked. This, my friends, is a real story. I mean, it's not a, it's not satire. This really happened, and they're freaking out. Now, there are laws in the United States about this. Quite frankly, that that um, uh, uh, define who is 
uh, somebody outside of the United States in another country and is a national and is in politics. And the definitions are quite clear. There's about 10 of them. You cannot do it. You cannot not do it ever. And he did it. And he had everybody, Scotland, Australia, Iceland, and the UK. Wow. And uh, and they're, they're gnarly emails, too. I mean, it just, and they bring up Brexit. Oh, it's hilarious. Let's go to the phones. Hi, you're live on Fade to Black. Hey, Jimmy, Brandon here. Hey. Hey, not Brandon. Hey, Brandon. On deck. How, hey, you know what, man? How are you doing? I'm doing good. How are you? I'm exhausted, brother. But, um calling in you know i'm really sad that uh nobody called in about game of thrones because i'm calling in about game of thrones <laughs> okay. <that's> right <laughs> bring it bring it brandon <laughs> all right well i've always said since all right you gotta everybody has to understand that the books which i read okay all of them and the the show are two different mediums they have two different scripts two totally different characters you know languages and stuff like that are you serious? Well, Rita, I haven't read the books. Rita has. Right. And, it's an investment. And yeah. she, well, she if she reads a book a day. I can't do that. But um, she was saying, now, I could be wrong, and she's going to tweet out here right now that, um, you know, I'm out of my mind. But I thought, uh, and I won't let her discuss the books with me because I just want to watch the series, and I, you right. know, I want to enjoy it on my own because she knows... Every, and I thought she said it was pretty faithful. And I thought that HBO oh, wanted yeah. to make sure that the storyline was exactly as uh, mm-hmm. as he was writing it, R.R. Well, the, the Dothraki, I mean, there is no Dothraki in the books, for example. You know what I mean? Say what? Things like that. <laughs> so, like, all right. So, just, uh, just spoiler alert there. Okay. Um, for everybody, anyway. Um check that but double check i'll double check it too but there's something about the dothraki that's yeah it's way off and it's it's different it's way different for example you know like obviously the there is very realistic gore and stuff like that but not like you see in the show and things like this so um they're very, two separate mediums george r. r martin you know you can read interviews where he said that yeah, there are two separate mediums but they are very pretty faithful um there are hints throughout the book, uh, series about Bran and his time traveling abilities. Now, this is not a new fan theory. This is old, and I've been saying it all along. Pay attention to Brandon. Now, that's not just because my name is Brandon, but um, <laughs> you know, like it, it, it's important in every single, I mean, book. And I know that's an important name in mythology and things like that. That's why I was named that, and. Um, and so, you know, you see this character develop, and, um, well, hmm. okay, you see that in past seasons you might not have noticed, but uh, people who have cared for him um, has, have said things like, you know, well, he's he's kind of like Bran the Builder. Now, do you, if you don't know who Bran the Builder was, thousands of years ago, um, or, or something like this, when um, what happened was um, there was a guy and there was this big war between, you know, the White Walkers and, and the men, okay? And a wall had to be constructed, right? But they didn't, this, so this guy, Bran the Builder, comes along and builds this giant wall. Now, if Bran can time travel into consciousness, right, and displace consciousness and affect things in the past and the future, Who's to say that he's not the one that makes little tiny, you know, flaps of the butterfly's wings here and there throughout the entire story to make it all come together? You know what I mean? Well, check this out. So there's no Dothraki in the books, which is freaking me out. But Rita was telling me the other day, and it was kind of a spoiler alert, because we're trying to figure out what's going to happen. Does... uh, uh, you know, Khaleesi just left Marine, right? And she right. said she's going to uh, the West to get married, right? She wants to get hit. Right. Would she marry Jon Snow? 
right? Right. Now, right. but then Rita told me uh, yesterday or the day before, she freaked me out. She said that Jon Snow is not a Stark. She's not. He's not the right. bastard son. He's actually Dothraki. Um, uh, yeah. No, he's not Dothraki, but he, he's he's actually Targaryen, which is what uh, Khaleesi is. Right. The blonde, the blonde, blonde. So anyway, um, what you know, the Tower of Love, the, the very final scene of the and spoiler big time for anybody who hasn't seen the Game of Thrones finale yet. Um, have you seen it? Yep. Okay. You know how the very end, Bran puts himself in the consciousness of, and you see a very young Ned Stark next to his sister, Lyanna. Yep, and she's giving birth to Jon Snow. Giving birth to Jon Snow. Now that's the Tower of Love. Right. That's referred to when Rhaegar Targaryen was at a, um, you know, a jousting match. And he was so handsome. He tamed all the dragons. He conquered the world. He was one of these, like, suave dudes. Um, and, and, you know, according to, um, Ned Stark's friend, um, Robert, right, uh, who's in the show, um, maybe he's, you know, he's dead, but, uh, but, you know, Robert from the North and, and he was, so Liana was engaged to him, but Liana saw Rhaegar. Yeah, yeah, this is what, this is what Rita was, uh, uh, telling me about, uh, over the uh, last couple of days. Yep. So, so, so they fled off. They refer to it in the mythology as her being kidnapped, right? Right. So, but, uh, and then the, so you hear the, you know, um, but you know, was she kidnapped or was she just in love? You know. So, um, and then Robert, of course, starts a whole war about it. It's a big epic kind of thing. But um, you're right. The books are very much an investment, and you know, long, long reading. I mean. And um, it's not something that you can just pick up and, and re- really read in a day, even though, you know, maybe read it can. I'm kind of like that, too. I know it's like, but um, the shows are, are the two different things, but they're pretty faithful. So anyway, Jon Snow is of the Targaryen line. Right, right. Uh, she just, yeah, she yeah. just tweeted, when did I say he was Dothraki? So, <laughs> but but uh, uh, Targaryen. And yeah. so does that mean that the two of them are not going to get married? That's the first thing. The second thing, what are the Starks going to do when they find out that they just made him the king of the north, but he's not a Stark? You know, now, right. does that mean he's not? No, I mean, and you know, it's gonna, it's got to come out, I would think. And this is, this is and before I let you go, Brandon, um, yeah. there's one other point here. <laughs> is uh, that him being the king of the north, and now we have um, uh, th- these three factions that are definitely going to fight for the throne, but right. what does that ultimately mean for Jon Snow? And, right. and, and, and is he going to, uh, because of so. the dragons, does that mean that the dragons won't have an effect on him? Right? That's an interesting question. Very, very good question, and uh-huh. you know, and that, and who will kill Cersei Lannister, or will she be killed, um, is another important question because I, I think she is one of the most detestable. Oh, uh, I dig her, women. man. No, I think she's cool. I dig her too. No, no, I think she's cool too, but in a bad way. You know what I mean? Like uh, she, she certainly like, didn't waste uh, any time plopping her butt down on that throne, did she? Right, right. Yeah, exactly. I mean, she's cold and calculating, and she's, I mean, if you read the book, she has a prophecy placed on her, all these things. Well, how about the way she looked, how about the way she looked at Jamie as she sat down, you know? Oh, yeah. She glanced up, and he's up in the balcony, you know? Right. Now, so now maybe Jamie will be the kid, like, the key killed Mad King Ares. He's yes, that's Slayer. right. He's the King Slayer. So, but but this is right. the other interesting twist to that. You can't blame her for plopping down on the throne as quick as she nope. did because Jamie was out of town, right? He was he was over, you know, uh sieging the castle, right? right? So he comes back, he has no idea that they've just blown up the sparrows. Right, which was one of the coolest things ever. But anyway, he had no idea. He's rolling into town. He sees uh, the smoke rising, right? Right. So that her sitting down on the throne, she didn't know that Jamie was rolling into town. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm guessing that. 
So it wasn't right. like her fault. Like, I don't think he can be angry at her. You have to have somebody on the throne. Sure. So yeah. he just happened to walk in at the wrong time. But man, brilliant writing. Now, and this oh, is, yeah, I agree. and before I let you go, Brandon, um, yeah. George Martin, George R. R. Has yeah. although he hasn't finished the book yet, and he's still rewriting, and he and he released a chapter, and then rewrote it and re-released it. But he has said that he has given all of the executives at HBO yeah. the ending to the story in case you know yeah. he's old, you know, in case he just doesn't wake up one day. So they right. know the ending. So they could sure. have ended it this season. I would have thought that they would because the book is out. We know the ending. Now the book yeah. has been delayed. So that gives HBO the chance to stretch this out to season seven. Two more seasons. It was, Two more seasons. Well, now yeah, they, and they announced this week that there's probably going to be a season eight. So right. there you go, man. They're going to milk this for all it's all worth. Right. Hey, Brandon, thank yeah, you for the exactly. phone hey. call, man. Brilliant. All right. Hey, man, have a great time in um, in uh, Roswell where uh, my brother is a big fan. He might be out there. Um, so if, if Christopher Young comes by, just, just tell him, you know, he might say hi. All right. So, T tell him, all right. tell him how to find me. I'd love to meet him. I will. I, oh, oh, totally. All right. Have a good time. You guys. You Thank too, you. Brandon. Thank you good so night. much. Hi, you're live on fade to black. Hey, Jimmy, it's Kevin. You're St. Louis. Hey, Kevin. How are you? Hey, not too bad. Hey, just, uh, to figure out where that last caller left off about Roswell, uh, uh, I, I, well, again, I live near St. Louis and, uh, just coincidentally, if you believe in that sort of thing, um, my kid's babysitter, remember my kid's name is ET, his babysitter, uh, who lives a block away from me, she, uh, she's from Roswell. Uh, <laughs> I just, I just wanted to share that. I always, I, that always blew my mind, but <laughs> right on. I, I I can't oh. wait to get out there. You know, last year and the year before, when we were talking about you know putting the fader bus together and 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 heading out to Roswell. Well, you know, uh, all of that was cool, but you know what? It's actually happening. We don't have a fader yeah, bus. We have a fader plane. But uh, you know, next year we definitely. I still say we do the fader bus. But uh, what was your question? Oh, uh, you know, I just. I mainly called in just to say I, I think I think last night's interview was probably one of the best. Like I mean, is that is that a fair statement? One of the best you've ever done, I and mean, that was pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, you know there there's always uh, if we look back and you know the uh, the first Jay Widener interview was amazing. Uh, the first Peter Lavenda interview that we did a couple of years ago that was pretty amazing. Last night was pretty cool. The uh, the Linda Moulton Howe one that we did on Thanksgiving two years ago, uh, where we didn't talk about UFOs, we talked about her for two hours, two and a half hours. That was an huh. extraordinary interview. The first uh, first Wilcock was really cool. The first Robert Shock interview that we did, the very very first one where I tried to get him to tell us what happened in the king's chamber when he spent the night uh that interview was amazing uh bobby schroeder uh his his first interview was good the first interview i did with travis three years ago that was uh an extraordinary you know you know what i mean so there's I, if i go back and start picking these apart there were a lot of really really cool evenings here on the show now with peter yeah, and, and uh I'm sorry. No, I was going to say with Peter Lavenda, um, it's such an easy interview because he's comfortable with me and he knows that I know the subjects and that allows him to let his mind go. And that's all I want to do. Just let your mind. I want I want to know what you're thinking, you know, and and we're able to do that because, uh, you know, we uh, we're we're friends and it's. He uh, he opens up, and he definitely did that last night. That was uh, an extraordinary interview. Yeah, I, I you know I I'm always sharing this stuff with with you know my my Facebook friends and such, and I'm always you know I'm always wanting to know what they think about it. But it, you know, as you know, it's it's hard to get people to to give this stuff a chance because they've just been conditioned all their lives that this isn't real and whatnot. But uh, and I and I and I'm sure one of these days, I'm sure as time goes on, I'll I'll uh, I'll listen to a bunch of those interviews you just you just rattle off because you know I'm, I'm always i'm always checking out your old stuff from the last few years but um you know i actually uh i i had the i was fortunate enough to have some correspondence with george knapp 
on Twitter, and uh, I told him that I thought uh, his, his Tom DeLong interview, the one from, from the one from Easter, you know, that just you know blew my mind. I I told him that I thought that was one of the best interviews that Coast to Coast probably has ever done, and he actually wrote back to me and he he agreed with me. <laughs> yeah, there and, you go. And that you know, I speak volumes, but also uh, just uh, along those lines. Uh, again, I, I've had a few other correspondences with him, and something he shared with me recently. Uh, you know, apparently, uh, apparently Ron Howard is in talks. Uh, you know, uh, for doing uh, like a movie version of Secret Machines. I don't know if you knew that. Maybe you yeah, did, yeah. There's, but... there's there's talk out here in Hollywood about that, and I think it's going to happen. So anyway, oh, man, that's going to be crazy. Yeah. Hey, I got to get to the rest of these calls and get less in here. See you, Jimmy. I'll see you. See you Friday night from Roswell. <laughs> Bye. There you go. Hi, you're live on fade to black. Hey, Jimmy. It's Josh from Texas. Hey, Josh, what's cracking? Oh man. Hey, I want to thank you so much for uh, hooking me up with Jim Mars. I appreciate that very much. Yeah. Not a problem, um, Josh. Not a problem at all. Um, on the Roswell, uh, I, I always think about that. Uh, I was a Dave Rudiak that, uh, did the teletype where he zoomed in on it. Yep. And it, and it said that, uh, the bodies are in the disc, the victims of the crash in the disc. Yeah. And I, I right Something now, up. yeah. And right now, um, I've, I've read that I've, man, I've read that for 25 years now. You know, I've seen the analysis mm -hmm. of, uh, of the the rainy Ramey memo, but uh, I think I just read somebody sent me something about there's a ten thousand dollar reward out now for anybody that can accurately uh, uh, decipher it, and I thought that it was pretty accurate. I, I've I've you know have enlargements of it, and I've read it, and it definitely says what it says. I don't know why. There would be a reward offered, you know, for ten grand on something that the basic elements of it are there. You know, you know, the crashed mm -hmm. saucer is there. The occupants, I believe, are listed. It's been a while since I've read the memo, but um, that yeah. that memo that he's holding in his hand is some pretty damning evidence, and it's it's pretty crazy because what he's holding in his hand in the photograph with the crash debris. Those don't yes. match <laughs> what he's holding in his hand and what that says and what he's, you know, he's there with Jesse Marcel. Uh, that's two right. different, two different things that are definitely conflicting. Um, I'll, I, you know yeah. what, I'm going to see uh, what I can find out about that in Roswell. They probably have something on that at the museum. So, all right. Hey, Josh, cool. man, I got to wrap up the show. Thank you so much for the phone uh, call. Take care, Kim, Bobby. I'll, I'll talk to you. Thank you, Josh. Hey, Les, how you doing? I am doing fantastic, sir. How are you doing tonight? Hey, man, it's Wednesday, and tomorrow we fly to Roswell. You know, Yeah, you, you guys be extra special careful this weekend during the travel, okay? Oh, man, don't say stuff like that. Oh, well, you know, it, actually, I was just talking to Rita on Twitter, and, uh, you know, Brandon, you did a fabulous call on the call, Brandon. It's making me want to, like, jump back in the show. Um if you ever get a chance, and she said you read a book a day, you're a monster, dude. You're an absolute monster. Uh, read The Wheel of Time by Robert Jordan. It's very. I see a lot of things happening with with Game of Thrones that also kind of happened with uh, The Wheel of Time about all these groups coming together for the final fight at the end kind of deal. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, uh, the the. I remember uh, George saying last year, uh, uh, RR, when he said, you know, if you guys are expecting the big battle, you know, it's not going to happen. And it was kind of weird how he's implying, because like in Lord of the Rings or or any uh, other epic journey that, you, you know, there's always the big, you know, the big battle at the end. And and he was alluding to now, look, there's a lot of Game of Thrones fans. It's been analyzed to death. I get that. And everybody has their opinions. But and 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 I certainly have the poorest memory out there. But he was saying, look, man, it's just going to wind down. You know, there's not going to be this big. If that's what you're expecting, it's not going to happen. And I don't know how it could not now. Uh, but back to your point. 
when J.R.R. Tolkien came out with Lord of the Rings, and then I went and read all the other fantasy books that came out after that in the 60s and 70s, and and everybody trying to write this big epic journey like Mm -hmm. Lord of the Rings. And it it just, it, it was imitation. And you could always see the similarities where everybody was getting their ideas from. Fine, I get that. But the way that Martin has written Game of Thrones, it's it's so singular and is so original. Um, it's not like, uh, you know, the Knights Templar, and it's not about the Middle Ages, even though it feels like it's there. And it de- it, it doesn't have those elements. It doesn't have the Lord of the Rings. It does, doesn't have any... Uh, it's it's totally original to me, and that's why I really enjoy it. Um, well, I, I don't feel like it's a, some tired rehash of some idea that came before it. Okay, so what do you suggest? Do you suggest I read the books first, or do you think I should watch the? And now I got up to episode eight, first season, before you know I cut cable, and you know I, I kind of fell out of the the whole thing. Uh, do you suggest I watch the series first or read the books? I haven't read the books. I haven't read them. It's Rita that's read them. Uh, you know, I don't have time to read. You know, I, I, I got gotcha. you. Ah, uh, yeah, I, you I, are busy, my man. Yeah, I, I, don't I hear to. you on that. You, do you know how many books are stacked up in the bunker from different authors? I get a book a day at least in the mail. And God, I can I, only imagine. I've, I've got them stacked up knee high, and and I I just don't have time to read. No, I I don't. I I would spend the next five years reading uh, what I have here, and I would never do another show. I'm I'm not kidding. It's it's just it's overwhelming, and it's all great stuff. I just don't have time to read. So going back and and trying to find the time to read uh, Game of Thrones, which is what it's five books, right? I think it's five. I'm not sure. Yeah, I believe so. I, I believe it's five. So here we go, man. Uh, Roswell this weekend, next week, pretty epic week that we've got set up. And uh, to cap off the week uh, with uh, the voice of Anonymous, pretty phenomenal stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And and just one more thing I had to say. You always thank me at the end of every week. I just wanted to take this chance to thank you for this amazing family we have. Because we really do have an amazing family. Yeah, man, Thank you I very much. I you and Rita both. Man, I, I didn't father you guys. You guys did it on your own, man. But uh, I appreciate that. But, you know, I, I it's, it's actually the opposite. It's me thanking the family because the audience um, and Dino, you know, call up. He always wants to talk numbers. I, I ignore numbers. I just ignore them. I don't care. But um, the 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 size of the family is one thing, but it's how everybody just interacts with each other and there's no mucky muck. And that's what I enjoy the most. It is just totally, totally humbling. And with, and with that last, get us out of here. All right. Special thanks to John Rappaport and to all the first time callers and fader nots who phoned home tonight. Fade to Black executive producer is Rita Kamurian. Special thanks to LJ3. That's me, Renee Jonas Mark. Thank you, Dennis. Thank you, Brother Bob. Announcers are Steve Harder, Gene Bateau, and Mark D. Kovar. Fady by Dale. Webmaster is Drew the Geek. Music, Doug Aldrich. Intro, Space Boy. Spaceboymusic.com. Fade to Black is produced by KJCR for the Game Changer Network syndication on KGRA. And with that, till Friday, Jimmy and I are out of here. Thank you so much, Les. We'll see you Friday night, Roswell. See you Friday. Fade to Black. This broadcast is only copyrighted 2016 by the Game Changer Network, and it cannot be rebroadcast, downloaded, copied, or used anywhere in the known universe without written permission from Fade to Black or the Game Changer Network. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Follow me on Twitter at JChurchRadio. Tomorrow night, best of Friday night. Been saying it all night long. We're broadcasting live from Roswell, New Mexico. I want everybody to be safe. Go Beckley Tepe.